Hi, everyone. Hey, nice to see you guys. I'm not muted. That's good. Okay. It's been a little while, Steve, since I've seen you. Yeah, yeah I've been um, between vacations and, uh, and required, required work meetings that conflicted. Um, sometimes it's a little hard to make things all line up, but um, I'm glad to be back. Yeah, sweet. No, it's good to have you. I don't mean to call you out or anything. Oh, no, <laughs> I know life is busy. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't feel, uh, I, I just felt like I kind of owed everybody a little bit of an explanation, even if it's, and, and you're going to have to do for everybody right now. Hey, Chris <laughs> Jaster, I don't know if I know you, but uh, I'm Steven. Hi, Steven. I, I believe we met. I'm trying to remember where um, once some time ago. Uh, it could have been a Zoom meeting, actually. Yeah, um, could have been here. Yeah, so... Just to introduce myself, I'm the, the director of ecological programs over at Circuit Rider, and we have a workforce development program for transitional age youth that's 16 to 25. And we focus on um, fuels reduction work. Um, we focus on restoration projects like replanting, um, weed abatement, things like that. Um, native plants and yeah, that's Sweet. what we do. Awesome. Yeah, it's great to have you here. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. And Steve, um, you want to share who you are? Oh okay. yeah, that would help. Um, so <laughs> I work for UC Cooperative Extension. I. It's funny because when you say you work for Circuit Riders, um, the former director of of my office. Uh, Ellie Rilla uh, came from Circuit Riders. I mean, it was 20, 30 years ago, um, but uh, you know, she, uh, so I'm familiar with some of the work that uh, you guys have done. You ran a nursery, do you, do you still run a nursery? Yeah, so we have the nursery facility, but it hasn't been functioning for a really long time um, since before I came on. Yeah, so we're trying to figure out how to bring that back to life. Um, it's, it's a beautiful greenhouse. We've got all the space, um, shade house, everything. So cool. we just have to figure out how to, what contracts that fits into and how to start it back up. Hey, um, so speaking of which, I have a person um, who is looking for nursery space. And basically they're gonna plant some things, they're exotics. He's, uh, he's looking at doing, he's a professor, I think at Berkeley, and he's looking at a particular plant. I don't have the name in front of me, but it's about saponin production. And he wants to do, mm -hmm. run a, do a trial run of um, at least 12 plants, maybe more. And he just needs somebody to be there and, and um, and water them. And I don't know if he's got money to do a contract grow mm -hmm. or something like that, but that, you know, that's all stuff that would you guys be yeah, absolutely that idea? Yeah, sure. Put us in, put me in touch with them and, um, and we can explore that for sure. Okay. So, um, what's, uh, what's your email address? Christopher dot Jaster, J A S T E R. And Christopher is P H E R. Yes dot jaster j-a-s-t-e-r mm -hmm. at circuit writer then the letter c-s dot o-r-g dot org so that's circuit writer c-s that's charlie sierra dot o-r-g right. um and this is about saponin production okay good i'll at least right. um I'll, I'll mention that to him he's specifically looking for something in the north bay so uh yeah. We'll see how that that works out and uh, and cool. Yeah. Thanks. Nice. I like to see that networking happen. <laughs> hey, Judy. In live time. Hello. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Hi. Give us a few another minute for people to jump on. Well, I'm joining our meeting from my car. 
happened to be in Santa Rosa this morning. Uh, got out of my appointment earlier than I thought. So uh, I just pulled into the open space parking lot and uh, figured I'll join the meeting here. <laughs> <laughs> like old times, <laughs> but almost in our meeting room. <laughs> almost. Um, that's great. Yeah, because you have a long drive home. So might as yep. well catch, catch it while you have it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, let me just throw up our agenda. Let's see. I've been keeping this kind of like funding opportunities item up at the top just so that we can talk about it if, if we have, if any news has come up. I think we're kind of in between um, funding proposals right now a request for proposals, but it'd be cool to hear if anyone has gotten any word about any of the proposals that went in or know of new like programs that they're interested in and want to share with the group. Um, and then we'll go into our just kind of like, you know, round the table introductions and updates um, and take it from there. So maybe we'll just get started with um, any updates anyone has about any of the grant opportunities that you're looking at. Um, or any you know that are on the horizon that you're interested in want other people to be aware of. So I'll stop sharing and uh, we can just popcorn around whoever has any updates they wanna provide. I'll go. Um, my name is Steven Swain. For those of you who don't know me, I work for UC Cooperative Extension. I'm an environmental horticulture advisor is my title, but um, if you don't know what that means, that's okay, because I don't either, um, honestly. <laughs> I, I work on landscape issues, um, mostly related to um, pathology, but uh, I've, I've been dragged into fire and weeds and um, insects and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, recently, actually right now, we have a job um, opportunity open for um, somebody to do um, coordination with Fire Safe Marin. So it's working on fires and working with homeowners. And we'll also be working with training uh, commercial clientele. We've got some interesting ideas to that we want to start marching out. Um, and so if you know of anybody who uh, works in the fire arena that might be interested in working for us uh, in Marin, there is some overlap with Sonoma County, not a ton, but it would involve coordinating with um, uh, fire safe Sonoma on at least a limited basis because we don't need to reinvent the wheel all the time. Um, uh, we've got a job opening uh, for you and I can uh, send it out to folks if or maybe I'll put it up in the chat here in just a moment after I'm done talking. And, and that's really the most pressing thing I have um, to offer right now and I'll, I'll let it go to the next person. Can I chime in really quick? Yes. So hi, Stephen. I know we've been emailing. It's nice to see you in the, the Zoom arena. Um, I'm the natural resources professor at uh, SRJC. So for the job opportunity, I would love to forward it to my students if, they, if you think they would meet the minimum qualifications for the position. Is it like requires a bachelor's or? Um, so the position requires an associate's degree and um, and a bachelor's is strongly preferred. However, you know, those, it, it's, as like most job positions, it's really about the person and, and what, who they are and, and what their background is. We need somebody who's familiar with fire. We need somebody who's um, uh, comfortable with, I think the, the bigger questions are, you know, do they have experience working with volunteers? Are they comfortable with a leadership role? Because it is going they're going to have to be able to work independently. Um, and if somebody can demonstrate that they've got those skills, um, you know, whether or not the, the university is going to insist they at least have an AA, we can't get past that hurdle. Um, but the, the BA strongly preferred is, is negotiable, like most things. Does that make sense? It does, and I think I know uh, the perfect person if you forward me the, uh, the job description. I'll put that in the chat. Cool. Okay, thanks. Nice, any other like grant or funding opportunities or updates? I need to go to, um, 
No, gosh, we're such a small group this morning. It's <laughs> kind of strange, um, but that's okay. Actually, that'll help us go through our agenda faster because we've got some great presentations um, coming up later in the agenda. So why don't we, on that note, we'll just switch over to just kind of our around the table um, intros and, and updates. So um, maybe I'll start with, um, well, Steve, you're the first on my screen. So why don't you go ahead? You already kind of gave a brief intro, but any updates about your work? Um, no, not really. So I'm going to, I'm going to pass on that just um, because I've been on vacation for a lot and involved in committee work. So um, I've had my head buried in the sand in some, in, in terms of what we're doing here. Um, so I'm going to pass. Thanks. Okay. And also I should add to that too, like if you, um, not just updates, but any requests that you have for support from other um, members um, or the working group in general, if there's something you're like, oh, we have been having this question and we wonder if anyone you know, has um, any information about that. That kind of stuff is really welcome during the, the round the table updates as well. So, all right, Chris Chaster. So um, I gave an introduction earlier, but I'll give it again. Uh, I'm Chris Jaster. I'm the director of ecological programs over at Circuit Writer Community Services. Uh, we do ecological restoration with um, city, county, um, non-government as well. Um, we do fire fuels reduction. We, we're wrapping up two weeks over at the Cooley Ranch um, in Northern Sonoma. It straddles the Mendocino-Sonoma border uh, where we're training up youth ages 16 to 25 to, to do fuels work, to identify um, fire fuel hazards, as well as um, different treatment methods as, you know, down to like chainsaw safety. Um, so they're all out there camping out um, outside of Bob Cooley's place and, and doing some good fuel reduction work. Um, we've got some other projects in line, um, we're kind of booking up through the year, which is really exciting. Um, this is exciting times for, for fuels reduction right now. Um, and then hopefully we'll get back into um, the, the more detailed habitat restoration, like replanting and stuff like that. Sweet, thanks. And um, I think and it's really great that you've um, just recently joined the group and hopefully can continue to meet with us regularly yeah. and give us updates on your training programs because um, we just redid our kind of um, work plan for the working group and identified that we didn't know enough about opportunities for building our local workforce and forestry mm -hmm. and fire you know, management. And so just hearing more about the progress on that program would be great. Yeah. Um, and any other like, you know, programs that you think we should know about. So thanks for coming. Yeah. All right, Judy Rosales. Well, we're working on a couple of things right now. Um, we have a, uh, a project that uh, was developed in partnership with, uh, with Jason Wells, um, our community, uh, our three VFDs. Uh, it's a shaded field break project Oh, let's see, what do we have? 501 acres uh, along 26 miles of road, uh, 9.3 miles is Fort Ross Road, uh, and it's the major access road to three subdivided ranches, uh, the Wallala Ranch, the Navarro Ranch, and the um, uh, Seaview Ranch, and it extends from Myers Grade all the way to the town of Casadero. Uh, it's been extensive outreach uh, right now, we have almost 100 landowners that, um, that have agreed to, to the projects, and now we're working on getting all signed agreements from everyone. Uh, one of the things and, uh, that I really did also want to um, talk to Shanti and Brooke about, uh, which we can do later, uh, so I don't want to just lay it on you right now, but uh, we are planning... Um, as a result of all of this planning, we're um, meeting with Marshall at the end of the month to look at a community-wide evacuation meeting. Uh, this, uh, this planning meeting uh, 
is just bringing the three DMPs and people from some of the smaller groups together to look at what this might look like. Um, as we, as I met with one of the Casadero groups, we realized, uh, you know, the co connectivity of everything from 116 all the way down to uh, Fort Ross and state parks, uh, which does include um, the Jenner Headlands, the Muniz Ranches, Sonoma Land Trust, Little Black, and Pole Mountain. And so as a result of all this planning for this big project, uh, it brought all of these community members together in a way like never before. And, uh, and that, that, that's good. We did get a uh, $423,000 grant from the County of Sonoma um, for Fort Ross Road. It doesn't really um, cover all of the expenses. Um, we're looking right now at reducing our shaded fuel breakdown almost two thirds from 100 feet to 30 feet. Um, uh, let's, Jason, our, um, our board members went out there this weekend and actually did some uh, boots on the ground reconnaissance on that road to see, uh, to get a more accurate number uh, of acreage and how we could fit that within our budget. So that's what we're working on now. It's just a lot of um, community planning community meetings, uh, people talking to each other, uh, and um, it's a pretty big project. Right now, we're looking at a little over $2.3 million uh, for the whole thing, <clears throat> and um, we're getting started on Fort Ross Road. Uh, Jason Wells is doing... Um, Cal VTP for Fort Worth Road, and um, we're also working with Matt Green. Okay. Wow, that is a huge project. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, thanks, thanks, Judy. All right, Melina. Hi, everyone. My name is Melina Hammer, and I work with Sonoma Land Trust. This is my first time at the um, Forest Working Group meeting, so it's nice to nice to be here and see everyone's faces. Um, and so I manage Sonoma Land Trust preserves in the Russian River watershed, primarily in the northeastern portion of the county and on the forestry side of things. I've been working recently. Um, we just completed two pretty extensive forest management plans on our on two of our preserves. And so we're in the coordination process, getting ready to implement that work. And for both preserves, we're gonna hope to begin implementation this fall. And then um, on one of the preserves, our Lockenberg Ranch Preserve, the goal is to complete the implementation of our forest management plan by the end of this calendar year. And about half of the forest management plan on our Live Oaks Ranch Preserve by the end of this year. So um, lots of work coming up ahead and it's just great to, to be here and um, hear what other folks are working on in the county. Great, thank you. Nice to meet you and good to have you here. Um, Jason Wells. Hi there, uh, Jason Wells, Forester with Sonoma and Gold Ridge RCDs. Um, I don't really have too much to update from last meeting. So I'll just give a brief reminder, I guess, the uh, North Bay Forest Improvement Program, you know, trying to get money to people. Um, and I'm still excited to hopefully hear back from the feds on this Water Smart grant for developing a watershed plan for Wallala River watershed. Um, that's one of the more exciting things I think I've got on my plate. Judy already talked about Fort Ross. Um, so yeah, I got to go on a prescribed fire last night, so that was cool. And, um, that's, that's all I got. Where was the fire? Skag Springs Road. Cool. Night burn. All right. Thanks, Jason. Shanti, good morning. Hi, everybody. I'm a stewardship project manager for Sonoma Land Trust on our um, coastal preserves, uh, Little Black Mountain and Pole Mountain in particular. And um, kind of similar to last month, I'm uh, still working on lining up uh, the last piece of funding for fuels uh, management at Little Black Mountain this winter and um, kind of combining 
various funding sources we're looking at um, opening up uh, roadside clearance and um, an evacuation route between the two properties to serve both the Muniz ranches and the Casadero um, communities, as well as um, maintaining our shaded field break at Pole Mountain. And then also um, obviously working with uh, TWC and Judy and others on looking at the regional outlook for um, uh, the landscapes of the coast. Thanks. Sweet. All right, and Brooke? Hey guys, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, everyone looks frozen on their screen, so uh, hopefully the audio is coming through. Uh, I'm the Sonoma Coast Regional Director for the Wildlands Conservancy and uh, working out here on the Jenner Headlands Preserve to forest management and fuel uh, reduction work, also fire. Uh, we recently received a grant through the Open Space District's uh, pg e funds to purchase a skid steer and masticating head uh, with a masticating head. So that means we can go actually go out and do some of the maintenance on our 130 acres of established fuel break. Uh, so we're looking into purchasing that equipment uh, and that will allow us to, to uh, knock down any uh, regenerating trees, shrubs, things of that nature. Um, the other thing that uh, the open space district would like us to do is look into a uh, equipment sharing agreement. So uh, they would like us to share this equipment with other organizations uh, that are doing similar work. Uh, so I, I'm putting that out to the group. If you guys know of any equipment sharing agreements, you know, that handles liability and kind of rental uh, insurance, all of those things, we're uh, collecting all of the examples of those types of agreements. Uh, so please send them my way uh, so we can kind of look through those, see what fits our uh, you know, unique circumstances here, uh, but then the idea is to share that equipment uh, with other groups along the Sonoma Coast. Um, and in that regard, uh, I'm working with Judy and some other folks. Uh, we're trying to form uh, what we're calling the Sonoma Coast Collaborative, um, and uh, really that is kind of a, a loose-knit organizations of communities along this coast. We have a, a very diverse um, a group of landowners out here, small parcels to large parcels, uh, uh, generational families that have been out here for a very long time and then also newcomers. So a very diverse population and it's, it's definitely clear that they are ready to begin working in a focused manner on fuels reduction along the coast. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is form the Sonoma Coast Collaborative uh, a loose net group of all these organizations. And really the, the idea is that the thing that would tie these organizations together uh, would be a comprehensive planning map that we can all agree on that this is where we'll have our shaded fuel breaks, our evacuation routes, our safety zones for the, for the communities. So we wanna sit down with uh, Marshall and the other fire chiefs, develop a, a preliminary uh, fire planning map and then also sit down with uh, the communities out here along the Sonoma Coast, uh, put that map together. And then the idea is that each one of us uh, would work to establish those fuel breaks, but it would be a continuous fuel break or an evacuation route from, from our properties onto the adjacent, uh, our neighboring properties, so that we can have this comprehensive, continuous uh, fuel reduction zone throughout the Sonoma Coast. Uh, so that was what would really tie the group together. Um, I've already sent that out to Marshall and Ben, and they said that, uh, you know, the basic framework that we're working on is looking good. Uh, so we're going to be moving forward with that. And it sounds like Judy is well along the way of bringing in some grant dollars to actually start working on this. So that's great news, Judy. Uh, I'm really interested to talk to you a little bit more, perhaps uh, later today or Friday, uh, we can talk. But uh, again, trying to put the, the communities together and working towards fuel reduction. And really the long-term uh, goal would be working towards well-managed forests uh, that are uh, resilient to, to climate change and also catastrophic wildfire. So that's it for me. Yeah. I'd like to just jump in, uh, Brooke, at what, what, on what Brooke was saying on, they got equipment, uh, the Guala Ranch also um, got a chipper from the uh, PG&E Settlement Fund. Timber Cove Fire Department got a chipper. 
we put in for a chipper. So we have four pieces of, of equipment there on the coast that uh, we are all looking at the same thing as Brooke was saying, is how can we share um, this equipment, uh, you know, among our communities. So, uh, you know, I think that that's pretty exciting for all of us out there. And uh, so I just wanted to add that, add that in uh, about the extra equipment. Thanks, Brooke. Thank you. That's super exciting. Great. Um, okay, um, Brianna. Good morning, everyone. I think I recognize most people, but I'm still the natural resources professor at Santa Rosa Junior College, and we have some thrilling things going on this summer. So with some of the PG&E funds we received, we've started a program we are affectionately terming WERP, the Wildfire Resiliency Program. It's me and Natural Resources. We have the professor for horticulture doing wildfire resilient landscaping. And then our animal science professor is doing all things goats, including getting some goats out into our forest out at a Schoen Farm. And we've started with an internship program this summer that we've got half a dozen students who are doing some of the prep work for a prescribed burn in our 120 acre, very sad Schoen Farm forest. So we're hoping to do most of the prep work in order to get a burn going in spring 2022. And Brooke, you should bring your students out and get involved. So we've got all sorts of fun things going on. I'm trying to turn the farm more into a demonstration forest where we've mapped out different treatment units um, that will do burn piling, prescribed burns, or only mechanical, and then some control plots because science. And then we're hoping to get as many student interns going in the forest for the prep work, as well as doing externships of we pay the students to go work for you on your properties. So that's what we're doing with most of the PG&E funding. Um, and with the um, immense amount of woody material we're generating with doing the prep work for the burn, I want to get into biochar. So if anybody knows anything about biochar, I'm hoping to um, get a kiln and do some of it in-house because the other 250 acres of Schoen Farm is a farm. So we've got a lot of things that can be turned into biochar. So if anybody knows anything, please uh, send me a message in the chat. because I'm all about biochar at the moment. Um, but that's all we've got going on mostly at uh, the JC. Awesome. Well, I know I'm waiting for Ellie to spring up and say, well, I can connect you. <laughs> I wonder if you'll just choose me next. That would be easy. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm Ellie Inslee with the Sonoma Ecology Center. and. Um, one of the things that we have is a biochar initiatives initiative, and um, I can just um, put in Raymond Balthar's uh, email address in the chat for you. He, we have five kilns, and you know we have various grants to you know pursue and do some scientific studies about biochar. So I'll have to pass that along. And um, <clears throat> it's interesting that Steve uh, Swain put in the chat about this this job description for. Uh, what does he call it? Um, landscaping science and education specialist, because that's basically what I am here in Sonoma um, for for the the you know home landscapes. But I also kind of straddle the SEC because SEC straddles the not just the defensible space area, but the wildlands as well, and vegetation, fire fields management, and you know, pre and post fire wrap up afterwards. So um, we, and we just received a grant with the, um, the folks from Master Gardeners and Habitat Carter Project. So altogether, the three organizations have $110,000 to do education on um, defensible space that's biologically um, sound and, and so on. Sorry, my brain is a little bit slow this morning, so the, the words are coming out slowly. Um, we also at SEC hired a new um, restoration program manager. He is so new that I don't know his last name, but his first name is Barry, and I'm going to try to get him to come to these meetings in the future. 
And we also recently hired John Kanegi, and he's gonna be working with us in the resilient landscapes. Um, and this is because Jason Mills left about um, two months ago, as you all probably know. So we're still going really strong with the uh, fire fuels management. And we have crews, we have a crew right now with uh, five people and we're doing things all over Sonoma and Napa County in fire fuels management. And the thing I actually wanna bring up and I'm putting it in the chat right now is um, Marin has this very interesting organization. You know, they've got the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority because they have fund, grant fund or they have money through taxes that they can afford to do it. And of course, we all know that Marin is much more wealthy than we are up here in Sonoma. But they have this ecologically sound practices partnership, and it's something that I think we really need to get rolling somehow by getting a some kind of a um, a, a working group with everyone where we actually look at these ecologically sound practices and, and ways to do fire fuels management and, and agree to a common language and a common approach so that we're, we're doing it across the board. And I, I you know, we've, we've done, um, SEC has done a workshop in ecologically sound practices and we're just, we'd like to build on that and get some partners together. I'm not sure how we're going to do this, but I just wanted to bring it up in this and, and maybe there's some sort of subcommittee we can we can form. I know I'm kind of a broken record on this, um, but I just love to get some other folks interested in this. I know D is. Yes. So, yeah, so I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sort of focusing on this. I hate to use Marin as an example because we're way better than them, but it's, you know, <laughs> the template that we can, um, that, that I think is really important to, to work with. That's it for me. Awesome, thanks, Ellie. Um, and I have actually that program noted further down in the agenda. So if anyone has like dying to be like, oh yeah, I've been wanting to be on a subcommittee about that, or like you know what you want to talk more about it, we can do that later too. So great. All right. Um, good morning, Dee. Hi, buddy. You know what? Sort of um, coming to uh, my focus this morning is how much larger our projects are, the geographies uh, and the collaboration between the geographies is just really impressive. Um, and so I just wanna thank everybody and thank all their funders for, for allowing us to work at the scale that we really need to so that we increase the space, uh, the pace of, of our work. Um, on the Taking Action for Living Systems um, updates, uh, we just recently came to know that there's uh, the supervisors next Tuesday are considering uh, deciding to put um, a ballot measure together for June 2022 uh, on wildfires. Uh, I know that many of you knew that they had one uh, that didn't pass, Measure G, and so they're coming back with another uh, newer, um, a more comprehensive approach. Um, and so they're going to be really voting for uh, a team to put together a team to design an expenditure plan and have it on the ballot for uh, 2022. We're very interested in seeing uh, that that expenditure plan includes the scale and pace um, programs that we know we need and that the governance structure that they put together um, is comprehensive uh, so that uh, the um, uh, that there's just a lot more cooperation, collaboration, and, and, and communication, uh, and avoid duplication, et cetera. So that's, it's pretty exciting, uh, but we do need to stay tuned with it so that uh, we see that the expenditure plan is going to cover both uh, what we call vegetation management, as well as the consolidation of fire districts that is so needed uh, to um, really uh, increase the um, increase the ability of our fire districts to, to do what they are needing to do. And many of them don't have the funding uh, to do that. Um, we are also 
looking forward to decisions about the grants, the PG&E grants. Um, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the CAL FIRE grants that are due in July or August. And if someone has an update and if they already have, please put it in the chat because we're excited about hearing uh, about the grant that we have put forward for the upper Mark West Creek watershed um, planning process. Um, also, we got quite a bit of enough, enough funding anyway to hire an executive director and add to our capacity for doing research and analysis. Um, so we're very excited about that. And Ellie, that really uh, pertains to what you were talking about. Uh, did you already leave? I don't see her anymore. Um, but anyway, uh, on the- um, No, I'm still here. The treatment portfolios, we really, I would like to, find a time, I know we're both really busy to talk more about that because one of the things that we put into our funding proposal that we did get funded for is to, to, to have a dialogue on uh, the wildfire and climate adaptive treatments. Uh, so we really need to, to collaborate on that. And that, that's also exciting. And um, there's been um, part of the CLE report uh, mentioned hiring someone to then actually implement more of the CLE recommendations. And Misty at the Open Space District just recently told me that that veg management position is going to um, be out uh, soon for um, getting applicants. And they will be hired with the idea to work on the CLE um, recommendations that they haven't already uh, begun. So that was also very, very exciting. Um, I think uh, that is what I want to say, except I think, Brooke, I'd really like to, like to talk more of, to you about your, con, you know, your uh, string of fuel breaks and evacuation uh, routes connecting up because um, taking action for living systems has a uh, interest in forming one of our NECs along the coast. And I think that that could be, you know, really good compatibility project. So I'd like to talk to you more about that. Do you have my email address? I I have, yeah, I have yours. So let's see how we could uh, get you and Bob Ewing together because he's the one that would is working on that area. So thank you all. Sounds great. All right, thanks, Dee. And how about Ron Rolleri? <coughs> and Ron, you're muted, sorry. There, you hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm a director with Sonoma RCD and uh, I talked to Jill about to, on the 20th, there's a meeting for the Gualala River Watershed Council. It's been around for 15 years. Did any of you go to the, those meetings in the past? Okay. Anyway, I thought I'd check that in because of the, the Gualala River. There's a grant from the Bureau of um, Land Management. Um, and the, yeah, anyway, there's money coming sometime next year. So, I'm just keeping in touch with the people there. And I'm uh, listening to all of you, <laughs> trying to remember everything you're doing. You're doing quite a bit. <laughs> and Jason's here. He's probably going to be there. I don't know. <clears throat> well, we record these uh, meetings so that you can refer back to them if you'd like to, Ron, because I know we cover uh, an immense uh, amount of, of um, wonderful uh, things that people are doing and, and so we, we record these if you want to contact Adriana how to get one. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'd rather hear you in person though. <laughs> well, yeah, but if you want to check back on something. Oh, yeah, know. yeah. Great. All right. Um, okay, who's next? Let's see. I, I think Carol Leon's next. Hi everybody, nice to see everybody today. Um, crazy world, all kinds of stuff going on over on the permit Sonoma side. Um, we're working on rolling out all of our current projects involving structure hardening and defensible space assessments and incentives. 
Um, we're still working on the CWPP and I'll be talking a little bit more about that later. later. Um, uh, but of course the big news is the um, FEMA BRIC grant, which um, we seem to have uh, received. And uh, that grant in, at, at base um, takes three pilot project areas and applies holistic treatment methodologies to both built and wildland infrastructure or wildland areas surrounding those built environments in those three pilot areas. So that's sort of the ostensible main thrust of it. But one of the things that we're really hoping for is to help um, move forward best available science on climate change and adaption and all of the stuff that everybody is talking about. So I think there's gonna be a lot of opportunities that are gonna come out of that project for everything that everybody's talking about. Wanting to get done in the county and we're still in the very early stages of figuring out how that whole process is gonna work. But um, I'm super excited about uh, what that project can bring to the whole county in addition to um, the pilot areas which have been selected. So we'll see how that all rolls as we move forward, but that is a um, kind of a large distraction in my world of late, needless to say. Um, I think that's my brief update. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, uh, Carleone, is John Mack uh, more or less the project person at Permit Sonoma for the BRIC um, funds? And are there funds that haven't already been committed that will be available to um, affect uh, you know, what they do with it? Um, when you write a grant, you write a project and all the dollars have slots. With that said, there's you know, a certain amount of um, leeway that we may be able to take, but it was a project that was accepted for funding by FEMA and Cal OES. So it is a grant project. It is not a giant pot of money that they said, go ahead, do what you want. Um, there is some uh, leeway within that, um, but it's a grant project. And John Mack is, is the guy? Um, John, Lisa Hewlett, and I are the three primary, the core for um, Permit okay. Sonoma. And my boss, the, um, oh, this is a good announcement. Um, Thief James Williams, who many of you met in the past, uh, moved on and took a new job down in San Jose. And uh, the person who is now officially slotted into his position as the Sonoma County Fire Marshal is um, Steve Matursek who has been with us for years and who is absolutely awesome. And we're really, really happy to have him around. He's an unbelievably knowledgeable and committed guy. Um, so it's the four of us who are kind of the primary. So Steve and Mac are the bosses and Lisa and I are the flutterers. Can you put his email address in the chat? Um, sure. Thank you. Great. Um, all right, next is Peter LaCourt. Good morning, Sonoma County. How's everybody doing today? Uh, this is Peter LaCourt here, Forest Manager for Pacific Union College. I'm actually out here in Napa County, so I'm kind of tagging along with you guys, but a lot of what I'm doing out here is very similar to what you guys are doing out there. And as it's been pointed out to me, Napa keeps throwing fire at you guys. So, you know, I need to know what you're doing so that I can better prepare <laughs> to help keep you guys safe. So again, as I've said before, on behalf of Napa County, I apologize and we are working on doing something about this. Um, so the forest that I manage is on the Eastern Ridge of the Napa Valley above the city of St. Helena. It's about 1,100 acres. We've got a prominent three mile ridge line that connects the Las Posadas State Forest in the South to some private timberlands in the North. So when I started this job four years ago, what I did was create a ridge line shaded fuel break that I'm now working on expanding and improving. You know, uh, while fuel breaks are kind of an initial start, I really like the point that Brooke made that what we're working towards is a long-term goal of creating healthy, resilient forests. So I think that's always an important message when due to, you know, the nature of where we're at with fire right now, kind of the message is, hey, we need to clear our forests for fire safety. 
That's only half the game. I think another really important part of this is talking about restoring the balance to our forests, which has been disrupted due to the past 90 years of fire suppression. You know, a line that I've been using lately is that here in our, uh, our Mediterranean climate in California, our vegetation does not have the abundant, you know, uh, water that it needs in order to survive. So fire was that nice natural mechanism in the past that thinned out our forest so that we had a sustainable amount of vegetation to survive off the water that we have available, which is becoming less and less with time. So what I'm seeing in my forest right now is that I've got too many plants and then I'm supposed to get 40 inches of rain a year. Last year, I got 20. So I've got twice as many plants and half as much water. That's not a recipe for a healthy forest. So my ultimate goal is to be able to kind of thin out my whole forest, again, recreating that natural balance and then be able to run a prescribed fire through it, you know, periodically. This is what millions of acres need in California, and it's a daunting problem. But here we are trying to do something about it, you know, on the ground one day at a time. So I'd like to commend this group in that effort. And that's really more and more my personal mission in life with every day. Um, the most exciting development I've got right now is uh, recently the Napa Board of Supervisors approved year one of funding for a five year wildfire fuels reduction plan uh, around our rural communities here in Napa County. I'm also on the Angwin Fire Safe Council and I'm a board member of Napa Firewise. So I've got my finger on the pulse of that world as well. That first year of funding was a $5.4 million package, which I believe came from some PG&E settlement funds. About $4 million of that is coming into my little town of Angwin, which is known as the ground zero here in Napa County being a small little forested mountain town with one way in or out and about 5,000 people up here. So $1 million of that is gonna come onto my land and I'm hoping to start that project in a little over a week. I'm getting kind of some of the sequel wrapped up for that. I've got a non-industrial timber management plan for my land, which is helping with that. But when you're dealing with these things through Cal Fire, gears move slowly and a lot of people have a lot of opinions. So I'm a little frustrated with where that's at, but I'm confident I'm gonna be where I need to be when the time comes. My biggest frustration with what I'm looking at right now is, you know, I'm telling you I'm about to go do a million dollars worth of work right when we're getting into fire season. Now's really not a good time to be doing work. But that being said, as soon as fire season ends, we go right into the wet season, which has its own, you know, challenges for fire mitigation work. And when wet season ends, we go right into the spotted owl nesting season, which in Timberlands also has some implications for limiting work. Mm -hmm. And I know the foresters on board here will like what I'm about to say and the wildlife people won't. I'm very sympathetic to the need to manage to the best intention. You know, the, you know, we need to manage for Northern spotted owls, but I'm a little frustrated the way that management for one species dominates the management of uh, our ecosystems for a number of other animal and plant species. So that's the most controversial thing I will say on the call today. Again, I've got nothing but respect for my NSO friends. Um, that work should take probably three or four months. We're gonna have a water tender on site. It's gonna be carefully managed, a lot of mastication, some removal of a hardwood overstory in an area that's become overly abundant. So, you know, kind of the intention of creating and building on a fuel break, but really with the long-term goal of creating a sustainable amount of vegetation that is healthy and can survive periodic wildfire. So that's kind of what I'm working on doing on the ground here. And yeah, just uh, thankful to be part of this group and really appreciate hearing everybody's input and what they're working on today. Awesome, thank you. That's just great. Um, okay, next, Ivan. What happened? I'm sorry, Ivan, are you there? Okay, maybe we'll give him a minute and I'm gonna go to Lynn. Hi, Lynn, are you there? All right, okay, last one is a phone number. I think it might be Jill. Someone on the phone. Hi, uh, uh, um, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, okay. Uh, my name is Wendy Smith and I've been a member for years but I uh, have not been able to participate much in the last year. Um, I represent the Milo Baker chapter of California Native Plant Society in Sonoma County. Um, I'm also uh, involved with Sonoma Land Trust. So I think a lot of people know me from the past. Um, anyway, I am interested uh, 
at the moment. I've been working with the California Native Plant Society's uh, statewide group on vegetation treatment uh, and fire uh, fuels reduction. So uh, statewide, we have pretty large groups involved with this uh, from all over. And what we're interested in is knowing more about the surveys that are being done pre-treatment. Um, and uh, so I'm very interested in knowing more about uh, IDing sensitive plant populations and habitats and, and what is being proposed and what is being done actually um, to make sure that that there is some sensitivity to uh, the to the plant uh, plants native plants in those areas that are being treated. So thank you very much. I'll just uh, hang out and listen for a while, uh, for a while and I'm glad that this is being recorded. Thank you. And Wendy, so nice to hear your voice and to hear your energy. And I hope we can connect up sooner than later. <laughs> All right, thank you, Dee, I appreciate it. I, um, unfortunately, my husband and I lost our house in the Kincaid oh. fire. So we've been oh. busily trying to rebuild and uh, oh. rebuild something that won't ever burn down again. Oh. Yeah. Oh. yeah, great to have you, Wendy. Okay, I'm gonna try Lynn again. I think she's there. Okay, um, this is Lynn Garrick. I'm sorry, I came in late to the meeting. If you're just doing introductions, then I'm up in the upper Mark West watershed. What else were you asking for, Adriana? Yeah, um, updates and anything, any help that you're looking for from, um, from the group. Uh, I'm not sure where we last share the news, but we are excited to have a grant up in the Upper Mark West watershed with Sonoma RCD to do defensible space around 55 homes and to maintain a fire break that was put in by Cal Fire last year. So that's um, kind of our focus up here right now. And we are always looking for all kinds of help. So um, I'll listen and see what seems like it might apply. Nice to see you all. Hey, okay. Um, all right, and we, let's see, I'm going to try Ivan one more time. Ivan, I don't know if you're there. Um, if you come in later, we can always pop back to you, but I'm going to have to move us on now to the next part of our agenda, and let me just throw the um, agenda back up. Let's see. Okay, so great. We have next is the steering committee report. I don't think that Dee and I have anything really to share. Do you have anything, Dee? No. No? Okay, cool. We can, we can, I'm gonna try and breeze through some of these things because I wanna make sure we have plenty of time for, um, okay. for yeah, Carleone and for Marshall. So Carleone, you're next. Um, you're gonna give us an update on, on kind of how the seat of the county's CWPP update has been collecting projects and all the information that you guys are hoping to get from the community. And you can share your screen if that's um, if you'd like to. Um, we have put up a new survey that has a lot more project information. So if you go to the hub site, and I can post that in here again if, if we need it. But if you go to the hub site, there's a new survey that is um, collecting more specific and um, data for projects that might be easier. Um, for some people to enter as opposed to going in and doing it um, on the map. Um, we were finding that some people were having a hard time um, with the GIS side of it. Um, it's, you know, it's, it all depends on who you are and what your abilities are. Um, I'd be um, really happy to know if anybody has gone in and done that. Um, and if they have, if they've had any issues. So um, Adriana, how did it work? going and putting my project into the map. Um, it was not very, you know, yeah, it wasn't exactly intuitive about how to do it. I think once I figured it out, I, I could, but the thing that actually kind of got me was that you um, can only put in so many like characters of text. It's kind of not, it's like maybe a sentence worth to describe your project. And um, so I, I was kind of like, oh, you know, but you can um, attach a document so that, you know, if you want to put in more info, you can just kind of put in the title of the project and then put it, upload a document and that should be fine. Yeah, as we really would like to have those project descriptions be very short and to the point so that we can sort them out 
more easily because if they, it, you know, if, if you let people describe a project in a thousand words, they're going to do it in a thousand words, and then it's it's it, a lot harder to understand. Is this uh, vegetation management? Is it out, outreach and education? So that's kind of what we're hoping for there. And then this um, that the, the survey may off, may change again depending on um, we're putting together a committee of people to sort of look at how we want to. Um, separate out the uh, different sorts of projects that are coming in because I think I mentioned last time that we've got everything from I hate my neighbor's eucalyptus tree to I have a fully developed sequel plan and I have contractors on board and I have all that you know we have it's the whole gamut of, um, of, of data that we have in there and we're just trying to figure out what's a what's a real project um, <laughs> that should be listed and prioritized in the CWPP and what's sort of a, a good idea that we can put off in a secondary list is um, so, how we're looking at it now. Um, this is Lynn and I did have a question, Carly, and when I went in to do the project surveys, um, it, was, it was exactly what you were just saying. It was hard for me to know, do you want to only know about projects that we have funding for that we're currently doing or do you want to know about projects that are on the priority list for the Fire Safe Council, for which we don't have funding, but we'd like you to include them in the county CWPP? So it was hard for me to know if you wanted all of those things. I, you have a designation for projects, and I think there was a designation for risks, and I wasn't exactly sure what those two terms meant. And then if we have 18 priorities for our Fire Safe Council, do you want me to do 18 surveys? If you want, um, I think that we're going to want to limit groups like, you know, yours who have this really full blown project. I, I think that the way we're going to probably need to look at this is that you have those listed in your own CWPP, all 18, correct? So how about if we asked you, and that was why, you know, I kind of, I think I popped you an email back and said, well, how would, could you prioritize maybe three, maybe five of those projects? So that groups who have a very large number of projects, we can pop in your top three into the countywide list. And in the meantime, you still have them listed in your local plan. So you can still refer to them, but that way that sort of hit both and would get a better idea of what the, really, really top layer projects are for folks out there um, so that we can kind of um, get a, a, a more um, exacting and collaborative and precise picture of what people are really, really wanting to do. Did that make sense? It, it does. And could you give me an example because um, if we're picking three, of, an example of how specific you're looking for. I mean, are we talking about one of our top three is a um, fire break east of Gates Road? That's very specific. Or is, is the language you're looking for, we're looking, our top, one of our top threes is fuel reduction in the Upper Mark West watershed. How specific do you want us to be when we try to hone in? I think we need specific. Okay. If you have three projects for which you really want to seek funding, I think that those should be listed as specifically as we can get them in there so that, you know, as opportunities arise, um, you've got them, they're good to go. Um, we know exactly where the project's at. So okay, um, what, I'm, what I'm getting from you, Lynn, is that I need to, um, increase the descriptions that are in the survey. What's risk, what's a project, what, so I need to put in descriptions of what you're looking for. They could be probably, I don't know, we'll, Esther will figure out how to make that happen. Um, and maybe look at the text limitations. Adriana, you want them a little bit longer than what they are? Is that gonna make life easier for you or? You know, I just thought that they were kind of oddly short, but it, I think you can, you know, if people just figure out what, what small thing they want to say, that's fine. Okay. And okay. also, uh, Carolyn, 
when I was putting in my uh, project information, um, at least I couldn't figure out how to put multiple polygons on the map. So I just made one big polygon of our project, which was overly large. Um, but uh, maybe uh, if there's a way to uh, delineate uh, separate project sites within a, a property, that would be great. Oh, okay. So you have one project that has multiple discrete um, areas. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We have a, a main ridge line that, that goes through the property, but it's broken up in the middle by some private property. So we have like an east and west ridge and, and um, that's how we kind of talk about uh, the project sites. I will pass that on to Esther and have her get back to you. Okay. Oh, great. This is really helpful, you guys. Thank you. Anybody else? I, I just on that note, also, if there's a way to uh, upload a polygon, uh, because of course we have this information already mapped. So I've seen on some online mapping uh, applications where you can upload a zipped uh, shapefile, uh, and then that would delineate, delineate the, the project for us exactly. Okay. So I'll ask her both of those questions, and I will CC you on the email to her. Thank you. And Carol, and I could talk to you about this later too, but looking at the projects on all three ranches in Fort Ross Road, would we uh, list them as four projects or two? I mean, basically we have them broken down now to two. Fort Ross Road is one and the private ranch roads is another. Um, yeah, I would say that's two projects and then the scope of that can change because that's okay. what you're wondering, right? Yes. You're wondering about the project areas and the scope. Yeah, yes. I, I put them all in and yeah, that's an assumption that we will have to make and I should actually make that clear somewhere to you on the survey. That okay. um, you know, if you have these discrete project areas, put them all in there um, with the caveat that um, they could change depending on funding. Correct? Okay, Is yeah. that what you're after? Yes, thank you. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to when we can have a discussion about all the projects that are in there and really bring all of the you guys' collective brains to bear on all of the stuff that uh, you all have to contribute to this conversation. Peter, that was a really interesting conversation that you had about what your stuff that you're dealing with now over there on your side. I think that we're gonna be running into a lot of those same issues. And so I would love to have a just sidebar conversation with you about your experiences putting those on the ground and how that's working out for you too so sure i'll put my email in the chat happy to have a dialogue with you anytime great that'd be really good because yeah the more we we really need to start working together i think in all of this part. amen so um and the cwpp can be an extremely valuable tool for all of us if we're all feeling like we have a, a role in it and we're all being considered. So if any of you are feeling left out of that process, um, please do let me know and let, and, and, I, and, I, and I, I hate to do this, but um, I have to throw out there that I am just so crazy busy right now. It's really hard for me to focus on any of my four jobs, but um, I am the one that I personally am the most attached to, believe it or not, is the CWPP because I think that it's absolutely a critical first step towards pulling together our wildfire authority, uh, getting everybody on the same page as to what we're doing and how we're doing it, how we're, because um, things are feel pretty chaotic to me right now in my world. Um, well, Carly Owen, um, I have a, a question that I think will clarify for me the most important thing for each of our projects in this by adding them to the CWPP is that then that gives us something to add to our grant applications and sort of our um, um, sense of uh, knowing, I, I don't know how to say that, but how um, that we're credible. By yeah. having you in there, is that is that the accurate um, you know interpretation? Yeah. 
and and that's why we're going to need to um and this is like Lynn when she was emailing me last week and she did an awesome job entering all kinds of stuff and thank you so much Lynn for doing all that but um you know it's it, there's going to be at some point there's going to be a fairly large ask of people who want to have their projects listed in terms of the kind of detail that we'll want to have for those top level these are almost shovel ready projects we have thought of all of this we have methodologies for getting our you know so there's going to be i think there's going to have to be some skin in the game from everybody who wants to have their projects listed that you've really sorted out those projects by um what's ready to implement and look for money for as opposed to what's ah, this is an idea and we really want to get this going but we're not ready yet and there'll be a place for both of those things and the way we're looking at it is that we will have a list of treatment priorities these are the things that people want to do globally that won't be specific to a group or an area or anything these are the things that people want to do they want to do prescribe burn they want to do fuels management they want to do you know watershed recovery they want to remove dead trees from fires all of that stuff will be listed as broad priorities, which could then be referenced in grant applications. So that will leave us a lot of flexibility. The 2016 one, if you take a look at the 2016 CWPP, you'll see um, there's a list of 14 priorities. And um, at the time I was like, gosh, these are so vague. Why would I, you know, I, I need specific projects. As it turned out, it was awesome having that list of vague priorities because you could pick and choose from that list to say, yeah, this is a priority in the CWPP and this is how it fits into that box. And so we'll have both the, the list of vague priorities and the 2016 list will have a lot more on it having been written before Sonoma County had any fire risk, right? Um, so things have really changed since 2016. And so the, the, that, that priority list will reflect those changes, but it will be largely the same. A lot of this will still be in there, but there'll be new ones in there. Um, and those will, are based on the input that we got from the meetings and what we're hearing individually on the side and the projects that we're seeing. And um, so we'll have that vague list and then we'll have specific, we're asking you to tell us a lot about your project. Who are, you, who are your project partners? Um, you know, have you, who have you been working with to develop this thing? So there'll be some more specific, not onerous, but more specific for listing actual projects. And not every project will be listed in the CWPP. Is that correct? If they're like really vague or something, I wanted to clarify that. Um, I hate my neighbor's eucalyptus tree is not a project. <laughs> and there are a lot of those in there that are sort of in that, um, okay. uh, of extreme vagueness. And, um, you know, I, I think all of us on the call today kind of know what the priorities are and how to do it. And there are a lot of projects that ended up that were just sort of people um, thinking they have an answer who don't have the background that all of us have in um, how to make all of this happen. And um, so they kind of need to fit into the larger box of what group think says we want to do, which I think we're all in agreement on, on the larger front. Thank you. I just want to chime in and give a comment to Dee real quick. As I mentioned, Napa County just approved a $5.4 million package for Napa Firewise to do fuels reduction. That was based pretty much primarily off of the work we did for our Napa County CWPP, which just finished a few months ago. So, you know, larger funders want to see larger overall comprehensive plans. It really makes areas look weak. And I think this is where we're in Napa County. If you've got a million fire safe councils and private landowners all applying for smaller grants, no really one quite has enough credibility. But if you've got one organization centralizing all of those parties saying, okay, here's our big plan for the whole county. Here's our priorities. That's really, I think, shows that an organization has the planning to be able to, you know, execute these large multi-million dollar projects. So in my experience, the countywide CWPP tying in all the private landowners is really the document that shows the largest of funders, you know, that you've got your priorities straight and can be trusted to spend money in the right priority areas. And the Napa CWPP is awesome. And that was also done by um, Esther and her team. That's a so great team. Have, 
Yeah, okay. are- we're, we're really, that document was gold for us. It was funded by a $100,000 fire prevention grant a few years ago, and it's paving the way for a lot of larger dollars coming in. So uh, in yeah. my world, I can't stress enough the importance of the countywide CWPP. Thank you, Peter. I, I Thank you. I Cheers. agree. Cheers. <laughs> Keep up the good work. <laughs> like I said, it's, it's a little overwhelming right now. It is. It's a big process. It took Carol Rice and Esther a whole year to build it. And it's getting in all the landowners and mm-hmm. it's really hurting cats, but it's what needs to be done again to say, hey, here's where we are as a county with all our priorities, opening up those kind of funds in the millions of dollar range, which is what we need. And making sure too, that at some point, I think we'll be sending out an email to probably through Adriana to all of you guys to um, ask you to put together a brief paragraph about your group where you are, what you do, um, how you fit into the overall thing so that we can have a floating list of those. I think I might stick those in the appendices in this so that we can change that over time um, instead of in the main document of the CWPP. But, um, you know, we want everybody to have, we want to have a description of what everybody does and what they can offer to anybody who's trying to put together plans. That's great. I just had a question in mind. Oh, so um, are you guys planning on having any more public meetings or any events that we should put on our calendars for this? Or should we just kind of make it our own homework to stay in touch with you throughout the next few months? I'll stay in touch through this group um, for sure. Um, The next round of public meetings are gonna be once the draft is done and there'll be sort of draft review meetings. and they're, um, we're putting together, we're currently trying to put together a series of surveys for like D requested that we go out to the business community. So we're gonna put together a series of specific surveys for a variety of different entities that will also go up on the hub um, to sort of collect some more data. And then um, we're hoping to have the draft done. I think the last time I talked to Esther, we were looking at um, late in the year, which kind of, was a head-on collision with fire season. Um, so we're pushing the draft reviews out to January because um, we've got fire season and then the holidays and it's just not gonna work. So we're looking at early next year for, for draft review. And you know I'll probably be coming to you guys with stuff all along because um, this group has so many of the people that matter all in one place. Awesome. Okay. Well, please let us know if you want more time on future agendas so we can kind of keep having these conversations or, or how you'd like to do it. But yeah, I think this is something that we should, you know, really, we should all be paying very close attention to this and, and engaging with your team as much as we can, not just because it's important that you know, you know, what everyone is doing, but also because like, you know, Dee was suggesting that when you guys have your projects in the document, it makes them more fundable because they have credibility as you know, being included in the county's document. And also I think it just you know, paves the way for partnerships when we all become aware of each other's projects, whether they're similar in the kind of project you're doing or it's a neighboring community that you could be doing you know, more with. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that we're able to kind of all work together on it. All right, well, before I change, are there any other last questions for Kayleon? Just answer. Okay. All right. Um, so let me go back to our thanks, agenda thanks everybody. here. Oh, sorry. Oh, I wasn't sure if someone had. Okay. Um, all right. So next we have kind of an update on our um, two year work plan activities. Um, just as a note, I think Marshall will be coming in at 11 30. So I'll again kind of be going through these quickly, but. Um, what we have kind of identified as like these three areas that we really need to work on as a working group. Um, The first one was diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, Second one was just supporting um, workforce development in the fields that matter to us and that we know we need more help in. And then the third one is um, kind of talking more about um, land conversion to non-forest landscapes. Um, seems like something that people were interested in saying that we kind of had a gap there. 
So um, I'm really looking, you know, I'm interested in anyone who wants to like kind of take on any of these topics and, and help us as a group learn more about them. Um, I'm really glad that we've got, I feel like B, we have quite a lot of insight on with um, Chris Jaster and Brianna Boaz. Um, and let me see, I was, I believe, yeah, our fire departments like um, Marshall, who's coming on later, he, you know, or someone in his office might be able to tell us more about the kind of work that the fire departments are doing to train up young people in the, this kind of realm. Um, so please just like keep bringing us news about these during our round, round the table intros. That's great. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I feel like we need to be reaching out more um, to get more information about this. And also thinking within our own group more about what our goals are. Um, I know in the past we've definitely talked about like wanting a tribal perspective and like figuring out like how, when, and why to engage with the tribes. Um, and we also kind of acknowledge as a group that we don't hear enough from um, all kinds of land managers who are interfacing with our forests. We, we um, kind of have like a um, real over-representation of agency folks, I think, and not as much of like the industry and um, even some of the other landowners out there. So kind of getting more of that perspective. Um, but again, diversity, equity, inclusion is kind of like, it's a sophisticated thing that I think it would be nice for us to get some help with um, so that we do it, you know, we do it well and we do it, you know, yeah, with, with some good advice. So um, I actually, some, someone who came to mind what, for me was Neil Ramis, who works for the Sonoma Land Trust. And I guess Melina and Shanti might know Neil. I don't know how big your team is, but I, I've talked to Neil a couple of times and he has been um, someone who has, seems to have like some insight on how to engage with tribes in particular and um, other kind of um, disadvantaged communities. So I was kind of thinking about inviting Neil to come and talk to us. If you guys think that's a good idea, we can talk offline about that. Um, but again, like I'm looking for any kind of advice about who we might want to um, help us tackle this one. So why don't I pause right there and just see if anyone has any suggestions. Adriana, I feel like we have done at least some outreach to the local tribes in the past. I mean, we've had them at a number of the events that we've held to sort of reach out to the public. They've invited us up to talk to them about sudden oak death and some of the other issues. So I think there is a relationship there. It's not well maintained. Um, I'll grant you that. Uh, there are people um, that we know we uh, have reached out to in the past. So, um, but it's a two-way street, you know, it's not like they're sending people to us every, they know we're, we, we, that we meet, but it's, uh, all I can say is I feel like at least within the, the tribes, we have, um, we've got a relationship and it's, it's though it's, it's a maybe arm's length relationship, it, it is there and you can, we can shake hands and we've done it in the past and it seems like it's working. Um, so that's not maybe my top priority. I do think that we should involve them on a continuous basis uh, to maintain that. Um, but I'm not sure where else we go. I mean, I think the private landowners would be a really great place, but that's a hard nut to crack um, in terms of, but that's what we're, our, I think that's part of our mission. That's where I see we might be able to make better headway. The question is how involved will they be? Well, and, and yeah, I can't answer. Just thinking out loud, sorry. Yeah, no, I feel like I've had some really similar thoughts to you, um, Steve, so thanks. It's kind of like a, you have to wrap, wrap your head around like, what are we trying to achieve? Like how, cause I, the other thing is like our, our meetings are in the middle of a workday. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know if we should really be trying to get more people to attend our meetings or if we should just be trying to um, pull people in at certain, like, it, you know, with certain projects or certain occasions um, or, or engage with them outside of meeting time. I'm, I'm trying to figure out kind of what would be the most accessible way to hold more people in. 
at the risk of being provocative, I don't think I want necessarily every land manager to send a representative here for every meeting. Um, it makes mm -hmm. the, the, the meetings large and the introductions really time consuming and it's hard to get through our agenda. I love everything about this size. Um, well, I'd love to see us build more of those arm length relationships and try and, um, and make a, a concerted effort to maintain those. In other words, you know, do outreach that includes some of the landowners. I'd love to see some of the, I think the if wineries were actually interested. I mean, they've hosted us in the past, um, you know, and they own a bunch of that upland area around Healdsburg and places like that. Th those forested hills just behind their vineyards that uh, supply them with water. I think they have, some of them anyway, recognize that, that they've got skin in the game. Um, I'm still thinking about how to uh, draw them in without making it like, oh, we meet every month and you need to send somebody here. You know what I mean? Hopefully. Uh, yeah, no said. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, maybe we can do, I think, let's see. I can just kind of put a suggestion out about doing a happy hour. It's like, yeah, maybe we could do like kind of more of a social hour outside of our monthly meetings when we try and pull in some unfamiliar faces to be like, you know, give them a soft introduction to who we are and really focus more on them um, and just see kind of like what, you know, what they want to learn from us, what we want to learn from them. That might be fun. Um, um, uh, go ahead, Dee. Yeah. Um, maybe if we had a um, particular type of forest, like a riparian forest or mm -hmm. a oak woodland or um, you know some variety some specific type of of um, geography I guess to I can't think of a better word and then have an expert or two to talk about those particular types of forests and then put something more out in um, the press to so it, like a couple times a year we'll have okay let's have this you know doesn't even have to be during a monthly meeting but just have a gathering where you're talking about a specific type of of land use like the riparian or like the oak woodland or maybe in uh, the, the forests that have burned or maybe the forests that haven't burned. I'm just saying to be more, and then, but invite a larger group so that people, you know, start to understand their um, place in the forest world in Sonoma County. And I like the idea of trying to get some um, agricultural people because they own a lot of forest lands uh, around their, their um, agricultural businesses. I'd love to have somebody, you know, from those organizations get more involved somehow. So I think we just have to keep thinking about it. I think that might be a good idea of kind of creating like a specialized, a special forum that just talks to vineyard, you know, managers, for example, and just kind of gets, you know, that land use type in one room. We can all kind of talk about that, the issues that pertain to that. And that would be one way of pulling in I wouldn't say managers, I would say owners. I think we really need to get to the owners, not the managers, and sometimes that's quite different. So this is Lynn with a kind of Pollyanna um, idea, which I'm known for. Um, one of the <laughs> difficulties that we've had up in our area have, has been the lack of communication and lack of understanding between PG&E, there are many tree companies, tree cutting companies that they contract with, and the landowners. And, and there's a difference in objective when they're sending tree cutting companies out to cut trees. There's a difference between their objective and the landowner's objective. There's a difference in understanding about what are proper um, treatment, best management practices, um, there's definitely language um, limitations in that most of the tree cutters that come out, I shouldn't say most, but many 
have limited English and many of the landowners have limited Spanish speaking abilities. So it might be interesting to start a conversation, a small group conversation between some of the folks in this group who um, know a lot about best management practices with PG&E and some of their larger tree cutting companies to talk about where's the meeting of the minds about erosion control and um, riparian areas and what could we, how could those two, three entities, the forest working group, pg &E, and tree cutters come to a greater meeting of the minds that does a better job on the ground? Huh, because a lot of the landowners you talk to are worried about erosion and protecting the riparian when they see these tree cutters come out. Yes, because okay. tree cutters come out, cut trees, um, damage the riparian corridors, um, cut trees in a way that leaves, you know, four foot, five foot stumps, aren't well supervised by their supervisors, and um, and often are doing that when landowners who have have had to leave because their homes have been burned down, aren't on the ground to see what's happening. And then the aftermath is really ugly. Okay. Yeah, I think, I mean, I feel like that is a good idea to have kind of a special small group conversation, like you said, about, about the topics that, you know, we kind of need more clarity on so that um, there's already an established understanding before the, the tree cutters even get there. Um, Okay, great. Maybe one more suggestion and, I see. And I will say the other thing that's really clear is that the tree cutters who work really, really hard, um, I don't think you're getting the training that, that they need to move up the career lines to be supervisors and managers. Um, so when I think about equity and inclusion, I wish that those guys who work really, really hard mm -hmm. um, had more opportunity than, than where they're um, kind of pegged right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. Um, Judy, and you're on mute. Judy, did you want to share something? You're on mute right now. Uh, for our project, uh, we outreach to almost 100 landowners, many of whom I spoke to personally. Uh, I have to agree with Steve that if we uh, encouraged all of these people to attend these meetings, uh, they would get big and overwhelming. What I found is that um, what their main concern is right now, what main concern is fire. And um, what we've done is we've looked for community leaders in each of these small communities to talk to and work with and take this information back to, to their communities, the HOAs, uh, mm -hmm. Casadero Fire, uh, even Timber Cove, you know, so I think, you know, there are, there are topics that are of interest uh, to people. And I think that uh, some of our organizations are set up to, uh, you know, to take this information to them. We, for one, are an organization like that. Um, we're going to uh, add a whole new section to our website about the different resources out there and uh, the forest working group, uh, I, you know, I spoke with a group a couple of weeks ago, talked to them about the working group. They'd never heard of this group. Um, and so I still think a lot of it, um, I don't know how you would outreach to so many people and then be able to manage our meetings. I don't know how that would work. And maybe looking for a way that we can get our information out there and maybe a couple of specific topics during the year where we would hold larger meetings. We hold an annual, the community forest holds uh, an annual stewardship meeting every uh, February uh, and March. And, uh, you know, for our area, we get a minimum of 45 people, but we bring in a lot of people from the forest working group to talk about topics of interest. Um, I know there are people who are more centrally located, but we're so far uh, removed from uh, Santa Rosa uh, that it would be hard to get a lot of people here. So I think what we're, what we're looking for is a way to bring the information to the landowners um, 
rather than bringing the landowners to to town. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, great. Well, I feel like we've definitely talked about some of the kind of like goals that we have or like just what, how you guys are all feeling about um, pulling more people in or, or getting more voices. And it sounds like it may be best to um, really focus on kind of outside of meeting forums for people to come in and, and meet and greet and talk with us and do some information sharing. So I'll keep working on that angle. And I would also like to, um, you know, have a few speakers maybe come in and just kind of talk to us a bit more about how um, they might see an organization like ours handling um, this issue. So, and I see some more ideas coming through the chat. Thank you for those. Um, I'll check them out a little later. Okay. So it looks like, um, I still don't think that we have, yeah, I don't think Marshall has joined us yet, which um, is fine. And that gives us another minute to kind of give you some updates on some of these um, new programs and outreach activities. So we've already heard from Brianne, or wait a minute, have we, oh, we haven't gotten an update yet on the Landowner Bootcamp. Is there oh, anything yeah. you can share? Yes, exciting progress. So with this, the first one is probably going to be in October hosted at our Schoen Farm property. And we've got about a dozen folks who have tentatively agreed to be our guest speakers. And the goal for this is to have these weekend boot camp workshops geared towards landowners. And we'd probably cap attendance at about 30 people to keep it manageable. And then to keep it more affordable, people could just register for Saturday or Sunday, or if they wanted to do the whole kit and caboodle, could do both days. And right now we've got funding to run about 10 of these weekend workshops a year. And the goal would to have seasonally specific topics. So for example, when it's planting season, we could go out and teach people the techniques of how to do planting. And then in other parts of the year, we'd have other more seasonally specific activities. And the real goal for this is just to give landowners an overview of what they can do, give them the confidence that they could do some of it themselves. And then a really important part of it is consolidating resources of who can do the work that you can't do. And that seems to be a, a bit of a pinch point and then um, with what folks were mentioning earlier, um, I'm working with the business department at the JC to come up with a new certificate that's essentially natural resource management plus basic business entrepreneurship so that we could get folks who are maybe already on these crews doing the tree cutting work, give them the kind of business know-how to either expand or start their own veg management contracting company to actually go out and do some of this work. So that's one thing we have in mind. And then people were mentioning getting um, ag and wine industry involved, which um, nine tenths of my department is agriculture and wine. So we've already got a lot of connections in the area and I'm thinking we could host like little forest working group special topic meetings at our Schoen Farm property to outreach to agriculture and the mini vineyards as well. Um, Cause I think that's also a really big part of it. Um, but that's that's most of the update. That's, that's great. Thank you so much. I think that'd be really helpful. And who wouldn't wanna go to Schoen Farm for a meeting? It's just like gorgeous out there. <laughs> okay, cool. Great, thanks Brianna. Um, and then, so just a couple of um, events on the horizon. This Saturday, we have a tour of a private forest um, property in Calistoga, looking at some of the innovative um, fuels management techniques that um, have been employed by permaculture artisans out there, um, the lead designer is Yvonne Rios. Um, and Matt Bancaro, who I think probably most of you know, but he, he's not able to come to our meetings too much. He put this one together. So super like kudos to Matt for putting that all together. That's great. Um, in September, I'll be working with Brooke to put together a tour of the Jenner Headlands Shade Field Break project. So that should be a lot of fun getting out there. 
And then hopefully over the winter, we'll do something out at Calabasas and a few other um, preserves to see what um, the Ag and Open Space has been busy doing out there. Then here um, is just kind of a list of other potential um, like sites that we might want to go and visit. So um, looking for volunteers to help put those together. Um, if anyone feels so inspired, that would be awesome. Okay, so last thing I'll mention is um, that I'm looking to put on presentations through the end of the year. Um, we don't have anyone scheduled for um, August, um, September, October, November. So I put together a, um, a poll for you guys to all fill out, kind of voting on your favorite topics, um, whichever topics get the most most folks, I will be scheduling the speakers for those. And they'll either be, depending on if they can do a half hour presentation, it'll be at our monthly meeting, or if we need more time, I'll schedule a special meeting, special presentation for that. But um, I've really been enjoying like having educational component to our, our time together. So I, I would love to get your votes on those awesome topics. So please fill that out um, soon. I think there's like a deadline in two weeks or something. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and see. We still do not have Marshall, so I'm gonna check my email and make sure that he um, could find the link. I don't think I have anything from him, so. I'm not sure, I just talked to him yesterday. <laughs> he said he would be here. Um, so maybe he's just kind of run into some a snag. Um, in the meantime, I'm happy for people to talk about whatever they would like to. Are there any burning topics that people really would like to talk about? You know, just real quick, we were talking about bringing the tribes and uh, we do some work with uh, Dry Creek Rancheria in Geyserville and they've got an NCRP grant where they're looking at returning the forest to a state where they can do um, traditional um, indigenous practices. So like, and that's, you know, re restoring it so that they can burn pretty much is, um, is what they're looking to do. Cause they can't, I think the consensus there was that they, they didn't feel like they could burn in a traditional way because the fuel load was so high. Um, and that's really what we're finding with a lot of places that we're doing treatment on is we don't feel comfortable to run a prescribed burn or even the three acre smoke permit burn um, because the fuel load is so great. Um, so, you know, they're, they're just working on, on that there. And uh, the contact, our contact there is uh, Chris Ott, O-T-T, -T, um, and he's there. I know that Sasha Berlman is working on that project as well, and that's an NCRP grant. Nice. Thanks. Yeah, some good comments in the, in the chat again. Um, Okay. And uh, I really like the idea of um, meeting over at SRJC and doing some some presentations and hearing hearing about other people's projects, and especially like a mixer hour would be great um, before or after. Yeah. So thumbs up for that idea. Yeah, agreed. I think that would be great. And I know you know too. It's it's funny. Like I know. Um, we used to have a conference every couple of years, which was sort of a big thing to pull off and had multiple, it was like over two days and we had all these different sites we would go to. And um, and we just haven't really put something like that back on our to-do list, but um, I think that would be, that would be awesome. Um, I also like the idea of just something kind of more casual where you just like kind of 
like have one one or two topics we're covering and, and just make a yeah like kind of a casual meet and greet about it so um now that covid has been you know things are easing up and changing i think all that's a lot more possible all right oh okay great thanks brooke marshall will join soon uh, yeah i just gave him a call he's getting out of uh, another meeting so he'll join soon sweet that's the way to do it um, well, good. So I actually, um, what he had suggested he would do is give us a presentation for about a half hour and then take Q&A for 15 minutes. So that'll definitely put us into the noon hour. So I understand if people need to jump off, but this will be recorded. So, you know, you can always look back on it later. Um, I'll put it on the website uh, in a couple days, but hopefully most of us can stay because I'm, I'm really interested to hearing what he has, has some um, updates. I like the idea, again, to echo back uh, just a second uh, before you guys were talking about hosting folks at the Schoen Farm and, and perhaps, and I'd love to host some of the vineyard owners. I mean, they've been very generous to us, you know, um, and, and Peter brought up a fascinating issue. What do they see as the barriers? And I've never heard this before that there's, that they're concerned about offset rules. I seriously doubt that that would be a problem but I don't really know. And who would we get to figure that out? Is that, um, do we need to actually, maybe we need to hold this in Napa um, or at least on the close to the Napa lines so that we can uh, lure people in from Napa. Um, Cause I'd love to see us have some spillover effect and be able to help those folks too, especially if it helps educate our Sonoma wine growers. And if it's a problem in Napa, is it a problem in Sonoma? If, uh, yeah, anyway, um, I think between the two of those, we could clear up a lot. I I'm hoping it will be simple and we can clear up a lot of issues of planning saying, no, we want you to manage your forests. It's not gonna best mess things up. That's but, right. You know, yeah. I think that is right, but I think that it would be helpful if we could get some kind of authoritative voice or memo from our Napa and Sonoma planning department saying that. And my experience on that, there's a major winery here in Napa County called Pine Ridge. And Pine Ridge owns some land in Angwin right next to my forest. And they've got this little 10 acre offset. And I talked to him about treating it. And he was like, yeah, I'm hesitant to do that because I don't want to like get the county pissed off at me. And I'm thinking, no, I'm pretty sure the county wants you to do this work to keep your forest in my town from burning down. So I think that memos like that would be helpful. I know that a lot of the people suffering from wildfire losses right now are vintners and they're very interested in offsetting those losses. So a major thing that they could do to, you know, make that happen would be to treat the forest next to their vineyard lands. Right. And, and you know, if we could get somebody from Napa and somebody from to Sonoma to talk to each other and co-present something, this is how Napa and Sonoma differ. This is how we work the same. I'm sure most of it's the same and there's some minor differences that it'd be very helpful for everybody to understand the differences and then be able to say, this is what we'd like to see from you. And this is how we can expedite that. How, this is how we can work together to make this all work in everybody's interests. Because I really seriously doubt Son Napa or Sonoma planning is like, no, we really want to watch you guys burn. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see that being their message. But I understand the vineyards, vin the, the vintners fears of, you know, stepping out of line and creating a huge problem. That's a good way to lose a job. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. I'm actually, you know what, Steve and Peter, I couldn't really listen to all of that because I was doing some other things. But would you email me about whatever you were just talking about? <laughs> yeah. If it's a presentation yeah. you guys want to put on or something, and then um, that'd be great because it sounds really. Yeah, Steve. Please email both of us. Let's get that conversation going. Okay. Sounds good. We'll do. Okay. okay. And then I just want to welcome Marshall. Thanks so much for coming today. And Marshall, are you on mute? Well, I had to figure out how to unmute myself. Can you guys all hear me? Now? Yes, I can. Okay, cool. I'm actually doing this for my vehicle. I just got out of another meeting. So uh, thank you guys um, for inviting me again. Um, I think this is being recorded this year. Um, and I'll try to keep it to about 20, 25 minutes or so. Um, I was asked to talk about the 2021 fire season outlook. Um, kind of building off the 2020 outlook. I gave almost a year to the date. Uh, it was actually, I think, July 16th last year. So um, let me just advance this along. Um, sometimes I get asked questions about the lookout on Pole Mountain. It's been a year, no 
real and um, uh, progress being made that we do have this design finalized and, and the cost is still looking to be 200,000. So we're, we're moving towards uh, demolition and also a, a fundraising campaign. I think everyone is aware of the alert wildfire cameras. Uh, those will remain up there. And uh, new this summer now is these alert wildfire cameras have, it was in the Press Democrat a couple of weeks ago, have the ability now to, I'm going to say detect fires, but they're not uh, really detecting fires. The Because uh, a couple of things have to happen. The camera's got to be aimed in the right direction, or it may spin around like do a 360. And then it's uh, daytime only. Um, and then there's been a couple, uh, you know, it's done great. It's beat a cell phone caller, but it's also missed a fire. And for Pole Mountain specifically, it missed the fire on Highway 1 uh, near Myers Grade Road a couple of weeks ago. So that's where we're at the lookout. Um, just real quickly, I mentioned I gave a similar presentation about a year ago in 2020. And here's what happened in 2020. We had a lightning come through in August, which started the Wallbridge Fire, which was named for Wallbridge Ridge. And it also was the Myers fire, which you see here in the background, where we had um, a fire literally burning down to the coast. So uh, good thing the ocean was there to help us uh, stop this fire. And then in September, we had the glass fire. And I'll show you a map a little bit later of the glass fire compared to the 2017 Tubbs fire. Uh, when we talk about potential or talk about fire behavior, this may be a review for some. Uh, we always go back to these th three fundamentals, uh, being fuels, weather, and topography. And just I'll give some of this away right now. Uh, the weather with uh, global warming, climate change, longer summers, definitely a factor. Uh, the topography, the lay of the land. So we know fire wants to do essentially the opposite of water. And we know topography can funnel winds. Um, so when those things align, specifically weather and topography, we call it uh, wind on slope alignment, full alignment. Um, that is our... Um, biggest problem. That's when we just, as firefighters, can't keep pace with that. And then fuels is vegetation and uh, land management practices and such. And I heard you guys just talking about vintners and forests and things. Um, that's something we can change or something we can modify if we want to alter uh, how a fire behaves in the future. You guys, uh, just so you know, red flag warning, this is the criteria. Um, we've had uh, one red flag now or um, this year already back in May. And uh, right now we're in a Maybe a lull. I hope uh, this, uh, at least where I'm at, Sonoma County, um, I think Napa County the same way. Uh, these foggy mornings are really helping us rather than having multiple days of a heat wave. So red flag warning is, uh, it's, it's uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is, if you notice there on the fire weather watch, it's 18 to 96 hours ahead of time. Like we may know seven days ahead of time, like, hey, watch out for lightning next week um, as firefighters. They'll give us kind of a heads up. And then as it gets within three to four days, it'll make it a fire weather watch. And then within one or two days prior to the actual event starting, confidence is up. They'll say it's a red flag. And so sometimes that gets construed to be like, oh, wow, it's it's escalating. It's getting worse. No, it's really that just that's this is how the process works. It has to go to a watch first, then a warning. And so um, the messaging about red flags, we want everyone to be safe. But this is what we look we look at for the National Weather Service declaring a red flag warning. And so you can look at this about, this is our fire season potential, our dead fuels. Those are our 10 hour fuels, which are the quarter to one inch diameter. Uh, that's a relationship to surface area to volume and how quickly they react to water in the air, relative humidity, uh, rain, uh, cool temperatures to gain or lose water moisture. The drier they are, the more readily they are available to burn. So when the 10 hour fuel moisture gets below six, um, and if you've been looking at some of the weather last week, uh, pretty crazy. We had 2%. We had 3%. I used to say 3% was pretty darn rare. Uh, it'd be the rare event, the 1%, the 2% type events. Well, now we're getting 3% on our one or two day uh, heat waves. And that's just because baseline with the drought, we are just baseline drier. The ground is dry. So these sticks, logs cannot get water from the ground. And now they're getting more and more months of dry weather. So they're just reacting to the atmosphere and drying out. So that's the threshold we got to get is 10 hour dead fuel moisture less than 6%. We got to have our grasses cured, no rain in the last 24 hours kind of makes sense. And then we need a, a, a sustained wind and relative humidity. So even though we're getting these two day um, heat waves, which thankfully are, have been very short uh, compared to you know two weeks, like a couple of years ago, we're not getting the wins. So that's gonna be the game changer. 
Um, and maybe that term gets overused about game changer, but that's the big difference right now. We're not getting sustained winds that are then driving red flags because we have everything else is there. Our fuels are dry. Our, our annual grasses, or let's just say grasses, it can be perennials, our grasses are cured and we're not having any rain. So when we get sustained wind has to last for so long, um, eight hours, and that matrix there is from the National Weather Service. This is custom to our area. So Southern portions of Southern California may have a different criteria. And so you you look at that and I'm just gonna generalize this. Um, and just to, to clarify, a 20 foot means uh, winds 20 feet above the vegetation. So that's winds not as affected by topography or vegetation. So uh, they're not the winds way up there, but 20 feet above vegetation, the drier it is. So the lower the relative humidity, the less strong winds we need. So winds are across the top. Uh, ranging upward and then humidity is on the, the left side there uh, going downward so that's the combination so um, when it's really dry really windy uh, that's our red flag and that's when we're getting these you know 2017 fire siege 2019 Kincaid we're getting these fires that we're just not as firefighters able to stop so that's our red flag criteria here's just something uh, this came out from National Weather Service San Francisco this is our local office uh, they put this out December of 2020 this is a little bit of, of uh, trivia, if you will, and I'll have to explain it because it is a little bit confusing. But what this says on the uh, far uh, y-axis there on the far left is the years starting at 20, 2006 on the top all the way down to 2020 uh, at the very bottom. And then you look on the far right, that gradient color scheme, uh, one to six, those are showing uh, that a, a one red flag event is a, is a black and a, uh, if there's six in a month, it's a white. And so I think you guys can see my mouse. But what this shows you right here, we had six red flag warnings in October 2020. That was uh, the last week in October. We had back to back to back three red flag warnings stacked up. Uh, if you're in Napa County, this is when the Pope fire happened. Um, but no, um, you know, no significant fire came about from this locally. But we had six that set a record. We had three in September, two, and then one. So we, last year combined, mm -hmm. we had nine red flag events. If you go back and look at 2014, 2013, this is when uh, Mount Canocta had a fire in January. Um, this is what I kind of think about, when, at least in my career, the beginning of what I call <clears throat> the drought years, where we had uh, 2013 here, one red flag event a month, but it all went all the way from April all the way in December. And then we kick off 2014 with three red flags in January. And then here's our modern era. So if you look, the month to watch out for is October. Four red flags, three red flags, five red flags, and six red flags. So just like this year, we've had one already in 2021. No other red flags yet, but we know it's coming. The only question in is, is how quick are we going to get our late summer, early winter, or early fall, or late winter rains? So I remember um, as a seasonal firefighter, I would sometimes get laid off in September because it rained and, and fire season, quote unquote, fire season would be over. So this really plays into year round fire season, year round uh, fire potential uh, also affects our ability to do prescribed burning and other vegetation management work because there's always a potential a fire could start. So that's red flag warnings. Uh, and then just so you know, here's our different zones we have. Um, 505 right along the coast, 506, which you hear about most getting red flags is a thousand feet and above. So think that's above the fog. That's above our daily um, cycle of fog coming in like we had today. And then 50, or so I said that backwards. So 506 is below 1000 and then 507 is above. So it's tricky, but what I tell people to keep it simple, if there's a red flag in any parts of our counties, it's a red flag everywhere. Everyone needs to be safe. So that's one thing we can control is ignitions. We can't control once a fire starts. So uh, that's the message you know, I kind of, I, I talk about. And so, I have a little bit of a forestry background having gone to Cal Poly. And so I like to look at, you know, what's, what's, what's the history is, is what we're seeing now in our fire regime a return interval um, historic, or is it off the charts? Um, you guys heard about 4 million, acre, 4 million acres burned last year. Uh, that might've been kind of the minimum amount of acres in California that, that burned every year. And we know from dendrochronology, looking at tree rings and things, um, you know, the redwoods do burn, are they just burning more often? And so, I'm just not going to analyze this a lot, um, but it's just like, you know, uh, by putting out fires, and I've said this before to some of you, we've kind of created this problem of vegetation accumulation. And so um, there's been bad fires in our career. Uh, you go look at Marin County. Here's there. They have a whole web page uh, designated uh, to this. It's, it's fall time, September 27th. And 
I know we got at least one person here today from Marin County. Um, I, you know, Mount Tam is, is overdue um, and it has historically burned and it's burned on the same days that we have winds also in Sonoma County or elsewhere too. Um, there's also this great fire that happened before the Hanley fire in 64, before the Tubbs fire in 2017 that burned portions of Santa Rosa. Uh, not on our maps, but it happened just like the Berkeley Hills fire in 1991. There's one in the 1960s and there was one uh, prior to that. So um, maybe not identical footprints, but very similar. So potential, I, you know, if you think about like a, a fault zone, uh, it, it's every once in a while there's going to be earthquakes on a fault zone. Well, it's we talk about wildfires, wildfire corridors. We know these same areas are going to have, have fires. So, you know, in Sonoma County or let's say Napa County, the Atlas Peak, you know, it's burned a couple times. The east side of Lake Berryessa uh, hit uh, Butts Canyon. These fires do happen. So these pass. Um, this is something that, you know, I, I kind of try to keep up on, on what's going on. And this is the messaging now that the California, um, you know, Natural Resource Agency is putting out there is that, you know, uh, by 20, by 2100, the average area burn statewide could in, increase by 77%. So, you know, I'm more and more, I'm telling you, know, I'm preaching to the choir here, but we got to learn to live with fire, build our houses to sustain fire, manage our wildlands to accommodate fire. Um, and we know, I mean, this is out there now publicly, this is what the science is saying. So there's kind of, we might have slow years, we might have the traditional summer fire season, but the general trend is uh, more acres burned, more fires happening. So uh, why do fires then, what's the potential? Why do they escape our control? Why aren't we effective? And here's the three factors that affect the rate of spread. And this is the Kincaid fire you see there on the, on the day it made the major run from early Sunday morning into Windsor, uh, held up there um, 101, is the wind. The wind is the most dominant driver. Even yesterday, the Dulcini fire in Marin County, 30 acres of grass, humidities were not that low. It's it somewhat the afternoon fog wind, went about 40 acres. Um, and that's just... Uh, an average day, nothing crazy. Um, it's how steep the slope is, because remember, fire wants to do the opposite of water. And then the changing fuel type, uh, you know, grasses versus brush versus timber, and then how dry they are, both that dead fuel moisture that I mentioned, but then also their live fuel moisture. Uh, the chemise plant is what we look at. 60% uh, is our critical uh, fuel moisture. And that's what you might have heard or read about with Craig Clements. He had the article in the San Francisco Chronicle about this year, uh, the chemise that he samples never took water on. So it started out the summer fire season months uh, below average, way below average in live fuel moisture. And personally from doing prescribed burning this winter in the brush, we, we saw that we, the brush was burning like it was summer, which it does anyway in the winter because that's when it's dormant, but it's just an indicator that things are dry and they stay dry. So that the whole curve of it taking on water and growing you guys are probably more versed than I am in botany and everything. We're just seeing now those long-term effects. And I think, you know, from my observation, I look at like madrone trees, they're taking a beating for some reason right now. So we're seeing kind of plant changes, I think. I don't have any science behind this, but things are happening now uh, in addition to the long-term uh, seasonal or year-to-year -year changes in the fuel type. So this graphic I like to, to show, this is why we can't stop fires. Um, once the fire used to be called in fire behavior, once it gets to the third dimension, meaning it gets up into the trees, we're just not effective. We can stop the wall of flames that's burning across the surface of the earth. You know, it may make that rapid uphill run up slope, but then it's eventually gonna back down the other side. We're gonna be able to be effective on surface fires. But once a fire gets up in the trees, produces embers or goes tree top to tree top, it's beyond our ability to control. And then, so this is the embers then being thrown into towns, starting a house, going house to house. Um, this is us trying to go out there and, and build this huge fire break, 20 dozers or whatever, huge destruction to create a fire break. It doesn't matter because the ember flies across it. So what we're left as firefighters is going back as our priorities are to protect life, property, the environment. So we're evacuating people and forfeiting firefighting, uh, which, you know, it is what it is. Um, so that's why you're seeing even this year in 2021, large fires in more Northern parts of California, they're, they're just, we're, we're not effective at stopping them once they get in the crowns, once they start producing embers. Um, firefighters may not like, like me talking like this, but sometimes if we didn't even had a hundred firefighters when a fire starts right there, uh, we may not even be effective on some of these windy days. We just can't assemble firefighters fast enough and then multiple fires pull us thin. 
So here's uh, an example where somebody did um, understory clearance removed, the ladder fields removed the surface fields, they piled the vegetation and then we did pile burning. And this is just an illustration, I'm not saying this is natural, how we should be doing business in the coast live oak forest. Um, but this is a, you know, example that a fire wants to stay on the surface if there's no continuity of vegetation, the, the heat from the fire can't preheat limbs and then spread the fire up. So some of the work, um, you know, on, on Jenner headlands, uh, this was done to a, a kind of the next level, very labor intensive. It was a small plot, but this is a fire that stays on the surface. We can stop this type of fire. So I'm gonna then fire potential, talk about seasonal trends and then day, daily trends, such as like now with the fog coming in, going out this daily trend versus seasonal. So this is something uh, not from California, but I think this is true in, in California. I just don't have the study um, ready available if one is ready available, but um, in Colorado and elsewhere in the subalpine forest, uh, these and, and the forest don't look healthy is they're burning uh, more than any time in the past 2000 years. And so this graph shows that if you look at these trend lines, whether they be the, the red line at the bottom, but uh, this is what we're experiencing here. So you can see the, the, the red diamond here burning three times historical average. And this isn't just in the last 20 years or last correction, last 10 years. So in my career, going back to 1995, this is what I've, I've kind of, this is what I've lived uh, very slow in the nineties and, and pretty busy in the two thousands. Um, you know, these once a career fires, these, you know, fires you, you, you brag about, uh, which is unfortunate because these fires do cause destruction too, are now happening. They're like, just, it's, it's expected. It's not a big deal now to see a hundred thousand acre fire. Um, 10,000 acres was big when I started. So um, everything is escalating. And, and you notice here, there's kind of no end in, end in sight here. It's just going off the charts, literally. And over here is the baseline, um, warmer weather, longer fire seasons and things like that happening. So seasonal trends, we know about the drought. This is the most current graph about the drought. Um, you know, us here in the North Bay, uh, it's only July. Uh, we don't know when the next rain's gonna be. And I've heard various uh, versions. I'm hoping they're incorrect. And I hope we do get rain this, this winter, but you know, we are dry. The ground is dry, the vegetation is dry. Uh, here's more zoomed into California. Um, this is the website um, I go to, the DRI website. Um, so in our, um, here's the rainfall and then over here is the um, temperature. And I think this little variant here is from maybe the Oak Ridge weather station we have uh, that's showing a little bit of green here in Northwest um, Sonoma County. Uh, but you can kind of see like where the fires are happening right now too, up by Siskiyou, Lassen, Modoc counties, Mount Shasta. Um, they're definitely, you know, de departure in the last year from, um, getting warmer and then also you look over here and you get um, you see the, the I can't see the title there but the uh, rainfall um, so this is another seasonal trend this is the BI the burning index uh, going from January 1st to December across the bottom this is you know 2019 with the Kincaid fire also showing you the tub so we know when this indice called the burning index is above the 90th, 90th percentile. So only 10% of the time is it above 90th, only 3% of the time is it above the 97th. We know the tub started on a BI day, uh, October 8th of 2017. The BI was roughly 40, I don't know, 43 or something. The Kincaid started a BI um, coming at, at about 50. And then here's a second wind event when the Kincaid fire really blew out, the BI was 60. So. These are the indices we look at um, to know, hey, this could be a bad fire day. And undoubtedly, when a big fire happens, it's pretty much a record setting day or a near record setting day. Um, but you can see even in the, so I might show you some more graphs like this, uh, but all the color coding is the same. Red is historical, uh, historical uh, maximum value for that day, not the entire year. So that is the highest value for that day. Um, you pull out specific years like 2017 is shown here in the, I'm going to call it blue. Um, green is 2019, the year of the Kincaid. So these types of things, uh, you know, I pay attention to. Someone might say, hey, today's a BI, BI of 50 today. And, and if you don't know what 50 means, it's kind of like earthquake of a 3.2. If you don't know the Richter scale, you don't know what that means. So these are the what we call pocket cards that some firefighters know about. Um, it's kind of getting a little bit technical, but it's some of the things I look at um, as far as indices. Um, our seasonal trend is, you can see, we're even compared to last year where we burned 4 million acres. 
the number of ignitions are up. So that's not a good trend in our favor, but that's showing you the vegetation's um, receptive to ignitions by cigarette, by chain dragging, whatever it might be. A lot of our fires are accidental caused. Most of our fires are human caused, but doesn't mean they're arson. Uh, it's just routine things on dry days, dry vegetation starts fires. So we got our ignitions up and we're already ahead on our acres. Um, not a good, not a good trend. So drought, ignitions, that's our seasonal trends, vegetation dry. Our daily trends with weather being the biggest variable. So I'm gonna talk about normal weather and no dozers going down single in a road are not normal, but that's becoming more normal for us every year, it seems like. Um, our normal weather here is, is the marine, the, the fog. And so this is all about the high pressure and the low pressure and where the high pressure, high pressure spin clockwise and push air down on us, compression and that causes subsidence or heating. So this is what causes our heat waves is when the high pressure moves right over us and forces air down on us. But this is showing the high pressure offshore, which is creating that spin. And then the wind is pushing parallel to the coast and the low pressure is probably somewhere over here. And so this is the time of year we kind of get that set up seasonally, um, the May gray, the June bloom, and this is out of San Diego, but we use some of these same terms up here. And you also can hear the, the, the mention about the ocean temperature. And so uh, I won't get into the inversions too much, but what an inversion means is as you go up in elevation, the temperature increases when normally the opposite should be true. You sh as you go up in elevation, it should cool. So when a high pressure comes in, the inversion gets created. And so that's our normal process um, of the fog, the marine layers. And so uh, large water bodies uh, like Lake Elsinore in Southern California, um, Clear Lake and Lake County has a little bit of effect now. They've actually named some winds up there called the Canocti winds. It's because water can absorb a lot of the solar radiation, a lot of the sun doesn't heat up and the differential heating between the water body and the land creates these, these horizontal movements uh, of air called wind. And that's the sea and lake breezes. So the Dulcini fire yesterday, that was the, the sea breeze, the ocean breeze coming on in the afternoon. And so that's our normal process. We also then get, get the fog coming in cool roughly that a thousand feet and below but the nocturnal drying event i'll mention is one of our uh will create some of our extreme fire behavior and how that sets up we already had it this year on january 18th and we had the fire in the geysers small fire probably didn't hear about um but this is what happens when the fog comes in so this is our normal process okay this is what creates our problem we get the high pressure over us with two low pressures to the left and right and remember this they call this the omega block this is the, the two weeks of just baking heat. And so day one's not too bad. Day two gets worse. Day three gets worse. It gets progressively worse as this air is forced down, uh, usually poor visibility, it heats up. And so we can see this coming as the highs and lows move across. And so the, that's, that's, this is kind of one of our uh, bad fire scenarios is this is the multi-day heat wave. So the vegetation doesn't get, um, take on water at night, things, continually dry out and then it's the once the high moves usually moves west to east once the high moves out it still takes a couple of days for the vegetation to recover so so far this year we haven't had the high pressure sit over us for multiple weeks multiple days we've had a couple couple day heat wave here and there but not the two week heat wave so when this comes in and sets up um this, this becomes a problem this this compounds our drought conditions, our vegetation, their stress of our vegetation. This is horrible conditions for firefighters and everyone to work in. And so this is a, a setup for, I don't wanna say catastrophe, but this is our large fire setup. So that's where I'm leading now into, and this is some doing some brush burning in February in, uh, in Chaparral. Remember it's very dry, so we can burn it in the winter. Um, and we all know now about lightning. So this is another, I'm just gonna call these doomsday scenarios, if you will, sorry. If you guys don't like that, but this is last year's scenario. Um, and what set it up on August 16th, that was a, a Sunday morning, is on August 14th, that Friday, we had really hot conditions, the high pressure you see there. And we actually had, um, remember the, the rolling blackouts and things were happening. So we go into this lightning event with very little rain with already very dry um, conditions. And so this is the moisture plume. This is a uh, this is fire weather um, modeling. So the coloring here makes sense to me that this blue means moisture, high pressure. Remember high pressure spins clockwise, low pressure spinning counterclockwise. 
injects this moisture right over our path, right over us and creates all our lightning, creates the wall bridge and Myers here locally. You know about those fires because they became big. We were successful in a lot of the other fires in Sonoma County, um, but you don't hear about them because we were able to put them out. Um, and then Napa County uh, got hammered as well. Uh, that was Monday morning, the second day. This is the Sunday uh, set up on August 16th. So that is another bad scenario. And I was taught or passed down to me by previous firefighters is when this moisture comes up on the west side of Mount Tam up through Marin County, that's what's gonna get Sonoma County. And that uh, proved true last year. Um, and then the second day I came up and went more up the Napa Valley, Southern Sonoma County and, and got Napa County. But if you remember that Sunday, the CZU Lightning Complex down here got going, farther down here, Santa Clara got going and then uh, Sonoma County got going, and then next day Napa County uh, got, got hit. So that's the lightning setup. Here's our offshore wind setup. Um, and if you look at pressure, uh, that's the amount, remember the high pressure forcing air down. So the higher pressure over Nevada here being measured at Winnemucca compared to um, over San Francisco, it's a lower pressure at 1011 versus a 1023. The bigger this difference, which they show here is an, a negative 11, the bigger this difference, it's showing you the stronger the offshore winds. And there's two setups for our offshore wind events. There's the North Bay offshore wind event, and then there's the East Bay wind event. So we know once the high pressure gets over here, we've got a low pressure over here. Think about these lines, kind of like a topographic map. The, the larger the difference, the equalization, the more offshore um, flow we get. So this is our wind-driven fires. And if you look, that was 2019, not 2017. Uh, this was a couple, about two weeks prior to Kincaid. Hopefully this animation is working for you guys. Um, this is in 2018. Um, this is showing the North Bay wind event. So you can see the wind starting up in Redding, up in the Sacramento Valley. It, it's hard because it's animated, but the, when you see the blue up here, that's the wind surfacing or um, showing up in Redding. They gradually work their way down the Sacramento Valley and they vector basically right over Mount St. Helena. And this is our North Bay over the geysers. This is our North Bay wind event. And so, uh, if we pay attention to when they're getting winds in Redding, winds start happening in Williams, you know, time-wise, we're probably a couple hours out from the onset of our winds. So in 2017, the Tubbs fire, the Nuns fire, the Pocket fire, um, you know, the winds were, we didn't get the winds about till 9.30 that night on that Sunday, but they were already getting winds here about 5.30, 6 o'clock. So you could just kind of see this happening. And then my belief is Mount St. Helena is like a big rock in a river. Mount St. Helena is winds are forced up and over Mount St. Helena. That has an effect on us then in Napa and Sonoma counties. You can see at the same time, Southern California gets their winds too. So the sundowner winds in Santa Barbara offshore, the more purple the color is, the stronger the winds are. Um, and so you see those winds happening elsewhere. So firefighters get pulled to Northern California and also pulled down to Southern California. Um, I'm going to skip this for the sake of time. It's basically showing the same thing with this, uh, the boundary here between Napa and Sonoma County, where the North Bay Mountains are at and how these winds set up. And I, my opinion here, I've been watching this. I don't have any scientific proof of this, but I just think Mount San Helena has a big impact on our local weather. Um, so we see things like this, which is really well known in Southern California, where it's just like the light switch gets tripped and massive rise in the air temperature, uh, this red line going up. And at the same time, with the green line, our, our RH just tanks. So this is kind of that onset, just, it just happens. It's just a, some people, some firefighters might say, I, I never knew this was gonna happen. And usually that means they just haven't been paying attention to history or the weather. Um, as soon as these winds coming off Mount St. Helena, and usually our weird coincidence here, it happens at night. Um, it's just, you can have drastic changes, just like you know what happens in Southern California. And so that's what happened in the Tubbs fire. And this is complex to explain this cross-sectional illustration here, but different colors mean different uh, speeds of the wind. Um, so 64 Hanley, uh, that great fire that Santa Rosa had, I think in 1939 or 1919, probably similar scenario and then 2017. So we know we know this is just our uh, a trend we have. And so it is known that we are getting uh, more frequency, more windy days, more setup um, like this. Um, so it's just like, we gotta be prepared for the next time tubs burns, it's gonna happen again. The next time Creighton Ridge burns, these, these, these you know, fault zones are gonna erupt again at some point, um, if you wanna look at it that way. So that's what this photo you saw before. Um, 
this is Mount St. Helena. This is actually during the camp fire that was burning in Butte, the most destructive damaging a fire in the state's history for the number of lives lost, number of structures burned. Um, you know, 2017 was a record year of the tubs and then uh, only to be unfortunately eclipsed the next year, elapsed the next year. So this is showing smoke uh, from the Paradise Fire coming up and over um, Mount St. Helena. So it's kind of like a wind tunnel, it shows you the laminar flow of the, the air, what the air is doing, the air is being forced down. And then that air is being funneled right through the Mark West Springs uh, drainage. So kind of a, just a, taking advantage of, a, of an opportunity to, to see that. Uh, you normally don't see that because you don't see the air movement, but that's what's happening. Air is coming over Mount St. Helena and forced down. And as air is forced down, it warms, it dries, which then is better burning conditions. So a little bit more of that um, for the sake of time, move on. Uh, I, we talked about lightning. That's our normal California lightning that goes up the Sierras. Uh, last year, it just, it came up the coast. It just where that high, where that low was and where the monsoonal moisture was entrained. So uh, that's, this is happening. Matter of fact, I think it happened about two weeks ago. It's kind of the normal um, going up the Sierra Crest lightning event. Uh, when it gets shifted over, that's our, that's our problem. This is uh, the nocturnal drying event. Uh, this is not known by a lot of people. Even firefighters don't understand this. Um, Craig Lamentz also uh, documented this uh, based off the devil fire that happened back in 2003, where 55 fire shelters were deployed at two o'clock in the morning in the East Bay Hills. Um, is that at night, or are we, uh, let me back up, we have some of the driest air um, right along our coastline. Um, just a weird phenomenon that as air is forced up and over the fog or that layer of air above the fog is very dry. And it happens at night and it can change a fire that's barely burning like the devil fire into a fire that blows up, picks up intensity, escapes control. Shelters were deployed in 2003. And so that this term is called the nocturnal drying event. So if you look at some of our weather stations at elevation, and here, I think I showed this slide last year too, uh, the Hawkeye Raws at 2000 feet, Oak Ridge Raws a little over 2000 feet, 75, 76 degrees. And then you go down to the Santa Rosa Ross, which is about 600 feet, it's 46 degrees. So 99% RH. So usually, usually, well, this is in the fog, but above the fog, it's 13% RH and 75 degrees. So you can see a tremendous difference in air temperature between 75 and 46, and then a tremendous difference in RH between 13 and 99. Uh, this is the nocturnal drying event. It, yeah, everyone, most of the population in our counties lives in the fog layer below a thousand feet. Uh, very few, I think there's only one fire station in Sonoma County in the nocturnal drying, you know, above a thousand feet, uh, same in Marin County, but very dry, very warm uh, conditions. I can't say this is what caused Myers and Walbridge to, you know, um, literally blow up that Tuesday and Wednesday following um, the uh, lightning but definitely that vegetation above the fog um, is, is dry. Here's our, here's our history. Here's history repeating itself. So um, Tubbs fire, okay, 2017. The Hanley is not on here, but the hand basically burned the same, okay? Um, Tubbs fire, you know, did burn the top of Mount St. Helena. Here's our glass fire, right? Staying on the east side of the Napa Valley. Um, I've talked to folks that actually witnessed it. Um, it basically burned in the creek beds where Sterling Vineyard is. There's a stand of Douglas fir trees and spotted across, but this is showing a little creek bed burning there. Um, I was here when it went into Booth A State Park, uh, Checkerboard Vineyards area, and then it marched its way all the way over into Oakmont. So if you look uh, pretty similar, they're not perfect polygons or long skinny narrow fires because it got affected by topography as they burned drainages. But uh, the glass fire was burning north to south, but also east or yeah, east to west. And this was east to west. So I'm going to show you some more pictures later in the geyser. So this is the same thing that happened in 64 uh, when the Hanley fire happened. Um, so there's the Hanley fire in the orange 64 versus the Tubbs fire in 2017. I think probably a lot of you guys have seen this type of a comparison already. Um, this you know now is showing that it went into Coffee Park in 2017. So I'm just emphasizing that history does repeat itself. Um, it's just our, our failure to recognize that or pass it on. So same thing with the Nuns fire. And then following 64, there was the fires in 65. So I just put this in here. Um, you notice a lot of the fire names are the same like Pocket, um, Nuns, um, that 
you know, maybe we are in a 50 year fire return cycle for our counties here. It burned in the 60s. Now it's burning in the 2010s. You know, is it a, is it just a cycle we get into? Um, I probably won't be around in their 50, 60 years to, to prove myself wrong or right. Um, but is it a cycle we're in? Um, is this the bullseye on us? Um, the way I'm looking at it right now, the bullseye appears to be on Shasta, Lassen, and Modoc counties, um, you know, already this year. So maybe it's their turn. I hate to say it that way. And maybe we'll get a buy this year. Um, but that's not a good indicator that things where there probably would normally be some still recovery from snow, some 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 green vegetation is now, uh, you know, burning. And you, and you guys have heard this been said already that we're four to six weeks ahead of our normal curing cycle. We're opening up the fall fire season start period. It's, it's now starting now, or it has started already. And so back to these slides I'm presenting, this is just the 64, 1964, 1965 fires that happened in Sonoma County, but they also happened in our neighboring counties, uh, just like we saw in 2017, the dollar damages back then compared to now or can't even compare. So I'm gonna go through this quickly for the sake of time. Um, but here's here's the same kind of look at the geysers uh, going all the way. You know, there's been fires before 1991, which that fire was the same day as Oakland Hills. There's actually two fires in the geysers. Um, that's the green fire now here. Uh, short. Well, all these wind events are about the same. It's just the Kincaid had three wind events. Uh, the first wind event, Kincaid is in red. First wind event does this. The second wind event does this piece that goes into Windsor. But in 1991, it uh, didn't burn as far with that wind event. And even in 2004, it didn't burn that far as the wind event. We didn't even evacuate that many people. Uh, but in 2019, um, I need to do more of the analysis here. Uh, but from what I know, roughly the same duration wind event, 12 to 14 hours, kicks our butt. Um, all these, these are three examples of three different fire scenarios, all following kind of the, um, the same general wind. So will it happen again? Uh, I almost guarantee it's going to happen again. Uh, is the wind going to be different? Is the vegetation going to be different? Perhaps the topography is going to be the same. Um, is it going to happen more to the north and impact more of getting into Cloverdale? Uh, perhaps. I hate to say that, but this is a, a fire corridor. Uh, West County. So uh, Walbridge, we all know about that from last year. And Walbridge technically merged. That was, was also involved the Stewart's fire, which started to the north. So a lot of this is the Stewart's fire up here. The Walbridge started about right here. And uh, notice it uh, does have, even though topography played a lot into it, we don't talk about strong winds as much with the Walbridge fire, but this is the Walbridge fire. Uh, most famous fire before that, and really before 2017, other than if you want to look at 2004, 1991 and the geysers, uh, before 2017, everyone used to talk about the 78 Creighton Ridge. That was like our last major big fire. Um, so here's your Creighton Ridge fire. Going back to 54, here's the Charles fire, Gulala River drainage. Uh, this is due again. This is, I uh, hate to say it, this is, um, I, this is the area I cover for Cal Fire. This is, I think, is one of our, uh, I'm not gonna say it's gonna happen this year, next year, or in three years, but this is, uh, this is a setup I'm, I, it's, gonna, it's gonna be deja vu. This is gonna happen again. It's gonna be a lot worse. So there's the 54 Charles. And then just so you guys know, this is the fire, Myers fire from last year. So uh, that's the West County. Um, there is history in Coleman Valley too. I'm not gonna show it. So that kind of plays into, um, cause I get asked this, can, can an area burn again? Um, and you guys understand, firefighters don't understand this as well as how things get to climax stage and how things regrow. So what comes back is grass and some of, we have such good growing conditions in most of our counties from what I can tell is from what I know, the grass comes back uh, pretty well right after the fact. So grass can burn every year. Uh, if you go to, to Lake County, grass doesn't come back to other well, soil condition and weather or not as uh, good as ours. Um, brush and forest don't grow back annually. So they, that's when the grass takes over. And so it is a problem as it, we, we evolve back or, and I know there's talk maybe that redwoods aren't gonna come back in some of the areas that have now burned, but the grass can burn every year. And so as an example, this is the geysers area again. And if you look at this area right here, uh, this area has burned, burned in 91, burned in 2013, burned in 2016. And part of it, I didn't put it in here, burned in Kincaid. So this is an area that's in, in Sonoma County in one of our fire corridors that repetitively burns. Um, there's a, I was on the same fire 2013, uh, Thanksgiving week. 
uh, same fire in 2016. We just kept it on that one hillside versus burning like the McCabe did. So um, it's 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 tricky to say, oh, wow, uh, 5% of Sonoma County burned, the number's greater than that. Uh, so it won't burn again. It, it's not like that. Every part, every portion of California, every portion of California can burn. It's just some areas don't have the weather to burn as often as other areas. And from what I can see, like working on the coast and like the Myers fire, um, and, and people will tell me, well, it's too wet. It's not going to burn. All true until it does burn. And then people don't believe it, believe it happens. And so I think more we're getting, we're seeing that more and more. The potential is there for, for all of our counties to, to burn. Um, I know I'm kind of going over on time here. Just real quick on the indices, this goes back to 2017. So the burn index, I showed you the graph for. So this is what I look at. I look at things like, okay, what burn index causes our big fires? So the, um, what spread component, what initial component? So paying attention to these types of uh, indices gives us potential too. Um, you guys have probably seen this from the, the Coffee Park, um, Tubbs Fire, these fire worlds and or fire tornadoes and the car fire in 2018 had a fire tornado. There's been fire tornadoes in, um, in Northern California already this year. And so um, I previously had, in this presentation talked about wind being the game changer. I think this is like the next level now, uh, fire tornadoes, really scary. Um, just so much and so much, so much heat being produced, so much intensity, um, even in a field of grass that, that all that heat wants to rise and a fire whirl is the most efficient way for that um, heat to rise. And so that now creates this, this, this fire creating its own weather, pulling in clean air from the surface, uh, pulling fire, dumping fire whirls. Um, so these fire whirls, uh, 2018, a, a Reading City firefighter died on the car fire. So this is scary stuff. Um, um, I, I'm just seeing this as I talk to firefighters and I, I go to fires and I, I look at stuff. This, this is gonna be, um, and it's always been listed as extreme fire behavior. This is really going to change our scenario where fire worlds are becoming more and more common. It's just we're not good against wind and we're not good against fire worlds. There's nothing we can do. So it gets scary. So um, this is just to kind of show you the nocturnal drying event, kind of show you if you want to look at indices uh, or look at the weather, not necessarily the indices. I have the screenshot of my Pulse Point app there on the right that I took this night. Um, this is this year, January 18th. That's the snooper weather page. Um, all those values you see here are RH values at all the various weather stations, including Jenner Road. You can look at these are all a lot of these are PG&E weather stations, unless you see that they have fuel moisture. Fuel moisture is usually a fire department or RAWs remote activated weather station. So here our find it fuel moisture is, is five and six. So that would be in red flag criteria, even in January. Um, we just need to make sure we have the duration of RH and wind conditions to support red flag. And so that's what the color coding is. It puts color coding in that it's basically red flag condition criteria. So um, grass is not cured in January and uh, uh, National Weather Service did not call a red flag. But looking at Pulse Point, you can see when the wind happens, we start getting trees um, falling. These are all these hazardous conditions. Um, and then you look at the weather and here's our RH values and our wind and everything. So this is a, a fire that burned about four acres. Luckily, uh, it burned itself out of the wind, got sheltered um, in the geysers, and we got enough firefighters there. But there was other fires this night, too. Um, here's nocturnal drying with the fog layer. And you look at the, the weather station on top of uh, Mount St. Helena, uh, warm, dry, 2% uh, RH values. Um, because this is a PG&E weather station, it doesn't have fuel moisture sticks, so you don't know what the fuel moisture is, but at elevation, this is this is very dry conditions. Um, do I have time to take you guys to just look at some online stuff real quick, or I can make this PowerPoint available, but that's the link for that snooper site if you guys are interested in checking that snooper site out. And uh, this is the North Ops page to go to. Uh, I think it'll open... So this is something to, to monitor. I look at, um, you know, so, you can go um, to the Marshall, weather. You need to change over to your um, web browser to share that. Not, okay, let me uh, stop share. Is that the right one? Um, it's coming, yeah, there it is. 
Okay, so this is the north. I'm gonna go back to the main page. So this is the North Ops GAC. This is a uh, Reading. This is our coordination center for all firefighters. Um, it has you can see the fires here, um, but it also has information about weather. Um, you can go here and every day they post a weather uh, forecast um, that firefighters watch. That's what I'm watching. I'm doing prescribed burning, looking at the weather. And then they also put out um, a seven, seven, uh, seven day predictive services. And so this is what we're seeing here and we hover over it. We're in NC02 and we're all in the brown category for the next seven days. If we had some red there, as you see high risk designation, I don't see, I don't think anybody has any high risk, but that could be for lightning, for winds. Um, yeah, nobody's in high risk. So this is showing you what we're looking like for the next seven days so we can plan for that. Um, there's also the uh, fuels and fire danger. So this is those indices I was uh, talking to you about. So I'm just gonna look at the ERC and we are in um, North Coast Zero Two zone. Um, the blue line is our current year. This goes from January to December. The gray line is our historical average. Remember the 90th, 90th percentile, 97th percentile. And you can see we're about, we're above 97th percentile. And if you draw like a straight line over, we're kind of like where we should normally be like in August, September uh, timeframe. So um, kind of makes sense why, why things are burning, how they are. And then if you go up to where the um, Lassen, Northwestern, uh, Northeastern parts of uh, California, uh, it kind of tells you why why those fires are doing what they're doing, whether they're the Beckwith complex, the lava fire, the tenant fire. I mean, look at, this is this year's value. It's uh, definitely setting the record and it's uh, it's well, not there yet, but it, it's it's gonna be maybe the highest ever recorded uh, since observations have been being made. So I know it kind of gets, uh, you always hear record setting day and air temperature record setting, record setting. Well, there's another thing we're setting records in. and. Um, all this science, it's kind of, it's not precision science, how these indices are generated and everything else, but it's just, uh, it, it, I, I tell people it's crazy. You can look at these graphs and, and they're, they're large areas of land and they're not super precise, but then you look at where fires are happening and it's almost like, wow, it, this stuff is like spot on. Why, you know, you almost can predict where, where you want to go if you want to catch a fire. Um, it's just, these indices are just amazing. So that's just showing you kind of, validating why we're seeing these fires happening. Plumas with the Dixie fire, just very hard for us to control. Um, so that's just something to pay, pay attention to. If you guys want to go to North Ops GAC, I can send these links out. It just, they have the, the four month outlook and things like that here too. Here's the seven day um, outlook in PDF uh, format. Uh, probably not going to work. Is it showing up in my browser still? Can you guys see that? Yeah. So that's just a write up. So that's, we kind of know red flag is going to happen seven days out if you look at this uh, type of uh, document. Um, and then it's up to the National Weather Service to make it a fire weather watch and then escalate it. So um, anyway, this is some of the behind the scenes stuff that you can, if you want to pay attention to that, whether you're prescribed burning, thinking about if it's going to be a good day to go work out in the forest, with the potential for starting a fire or, you know, uh, to, to look at. So I'm going to stop this screen share and go back to my PowerPoint. Is this all making sense? Am I talking too fast? No, this is all great stuff. I know it's kind of review for some of you guys. And let me go back. Uh, that didn't work. You, what are you guys seeing right now? Me. You think I'd be an expert at Zoom by now? <laughs> now you've unshared, so we're back to the. Okay, let me. Did it go back to PowerPoint? It's loading. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But you're at the very beginning. Okay, let me. Yeah, and we're looking at your actual PowerPoint, not like in presentation. Okay. And now I lied. You're in the presentation. Am I? <laughs> Shoot. All right. Let me get back to where I was because I went back to the beginning. <laughs> All right. So we're kind of wrapping it up anyway. Let me get to the end of this guy. Um, yeah, here's the. So there's the websites I was just taking you to. Um, Here's some of my theories. These are the last two slides. Um, so I already mentioned lightning comes from the west side of Mount Tam. 
the third day and beyond of a high pressure subsidence. So when that high pressure comes over us, uh, you know, day two, day three, multiple day high pressure, things really get dried out. Even if we had fog for the previous couple of days, everything's dry. So that's what I, I watch out, anything beyond the third day. And then once the high pressure um, moves to the east and we start getting cooler days, um, everyone, okay, I can go mow my dry grass now with my riding lawnmower. I can go have an outdoor barbecue. And, and the vegetation has not responded to the moist air. And so things can still burn. So everyone lets their guard down, the red flag gets lifted, and we get like three fires that day. So that, I call that the relax day. Everyone gets complacent. Um, I look at the BI value and I previously talked about BI 50. That was specific to the Santa Rosa Raw Station, but the BI value of 250 um, for the CAL FIRE indices, that's a, a blended um, indice, a blended weather station indice. When it gets above 250, it's almost guaranteed we're gonna have a fire. Um, and then what we're seeing with the seasonal, the drought, our big logs. So we did some burning last night out Stewart's Point, Skag Springs. There, there's three, four inch diameter, just big logs that are laying on the ground that are catching right away and, and burning. Uh, the burn we did June 5th up there, uh, the logs burned themselves out in two days. So and then unfortunately, and I know there's some West County folks on the call. Um, this is what I fear about most this year is our forests. And we're seeing it right now in far Northern California, but our forests are taking a toll um, from the drought. And I'm not an RPF. I, you know, I'm just talking from a firefighter point of view. Um, you know, a grass fire is a grass fire. It burns quick. Uh, heat doesn't persist for multiple hours, days. Uh, not a, you know, some ember production, but not a lot of ember production. But we get our forest burning. We get the fire in that third dimension. We get the fire in the trees, fire in the roots, fire. That's it, it's very, very hard for us. So um, I cover this area. Um, I hope we dodge a bullet or continue to dodge a bullet. Hopefully we can get ahead of the curve in our veg management, do another proactive stuff like building construction. But years like this, I'm, I'm most concerned about our forested areas. So similar summer that I put together last year, uh, since I'm presenting in July, we already know we had an early start. Um, matter of fact, you saw the fire there on January um, 18th. We've had our cool, moist, foggy summer. That's been good. Um, hopefully, and I'm hearing it's gonna last through the end of the month. That's been great. Um, but the two week cycles, that's the high pressure coming in for two weeks. I, I've noticed that um, the last couple of years, we get a two week like heat wave and then it cools off a bit. And, and right now we haven't had our, our two week heat wave, we've had a couple of days. So we'll see if those two week cycles start coming about. Um, how many red flag warning days we're gonna have? Um, we've been fortunate since May, none. Um, but remember, it's, it's, we're, we already have the fuel moisture where it needs to be. Uh, the grass is cured. Uh, it's just and the RHs are dry. It's just a matter if we're going to get wind. Um, reduced ignitions. Um, you know, as a firefighter, I, I, you know, we know uh, people are going to start mowing in May, June. Mower caused fires. I think we had less mower caused fires this year. People have understood. Um, in the fall, you see people start dumping their ashes. Uh, April, May, a uh, burn pile escapes. So we, you know, there is seasonal trends. I think the word is getting out, but I don't know if you guys heard about the fire in Mendocino County, that was a mower caused fire uh, from someone that probably should have known better. So um, it's reducing those ignitions. Lightning, last year it's a wild card. Uh, there is talk that lightning is more gonna be more common in our future, but we know historically where most of our fires here are not started by lightning. Um, and then I hope one of these years we get an early onset, kind of going back to when I was a seasonal firefighter getting laid off in September, we get back into having late summer, fall, early winter rains. Um, that if it probably not never would, uh, especially in modern era uh, fire seasons, end our fire season, but at least give us a breather from these, these red flag events, these wind events we're getting in the fall. So um, hopefully that's uh if nothing else, entertaining. Um, that's the end of my presentation. Um, I don't know if there's time for questions and I can I can PDF this, but I think you got it recorded too. So, so thank you guys again. Sorry, I was uh, late joining. No, thank you so much, Marshall. That was amazing. Your knowledge is just incredible. And, and I know we got a lot out of that. Um, I think we can take a couple of minutes for questions. Maybe we'll just, we'll cut ourselves off at 1245. So um, I'm, I'm happy for people to just um, ask their questions out loud. I don't need to call on anyone. So this is Dee. 
And hello, Marshall. And I am interested to find out whether the cameras uh, are making a big difference in getting uh, alerts, you know, getting firefighters to places sooner or getting alerts to evacuation sooner, or maybe we haven't had enough uh, uh, fire events to determine that. But I was just interested in not only the cameras, I suppose, but the other uh, newer alert systems that we've been putting out there in, in our region. Yeah, so um, I can let you know that I do get alerts on my cell phone when a camera picks up smoke. Um, uh, and it's there's no black and white answer here. Um, so if it if it gives us, and I think it's going to be most effective in remote areas where we either there's no cell phone coverage or no one's there. Um, so July 4th, fire in the geysers. Uh, the camera eventually detected it because uh, from Geyser Peak because it was it was aimed that area. It wasn't the rotating camera. It happened to be aimed in the right direction, so it detected it. I think looking at when I get dispatched um, and, and working the math backwards to when Calpine called it in versus when the camera alerted my cell phone, it was pretty much, you know, very close. Um, there has been, I think Sam Wallace has been in the paper quoted about this, there has been situations where the camera has beat somebody calling the fire in. But let me just kind of, uh, kind of give you a broader answer. I, what I think happens uh, in, in, the, in the winter, the spring, people are doing burn piles, there's registered burns, uh, the camera will alert. Um, and it, and it, it, in this situation, it was an escape burn pile. So they beat anybody reporting it because I think most people weren't going to call it in. They thought it was a burn pile um, or, uh -huh. or the dispatch center kind of said, hey, it's a burn pile. So um, I think there's tremendous value in kind of as a, I don't want to say last resort, um, but as a kind of like a catch-all, like, hey, I'm just going to be kind of funny here. Hey, you stupid human, look at me. I got. I think there's a fire that I'm looking at, right? And so it's great for that type of, hey, just make us pay attention. It's another tool for us to use. Um, and then I, I sometimes talk about what old, what's what's old is new. I mean, why did we way back when put put people on top of mountains because we wanted them to call in fires and detect fires and like triangulate stuff? Well, now we're trying to do the exact same thing with cameras, which is a right. It's just great. And some of these cameras, if you know the area well enough, you can be like, okay, yeah, I know exactly where the fire is at. It's like, I'm at that mountaintop. I can go to that fire now. Um, so it has that value. Is it driving the alert and warnings? Yes, because uh, the alert and warning staff, the Department of Emergency Management is getting these alerts on their phones too. I um, mean, in some cases, they're the ones calling somebody and say, hey, do you, are you guys seeing this fire? So it's all this stuff is just creating the awareness, early detection. Um, I can't, I'm not, it, you know, I, I'm not going to put all my eggs in one basket. I think it's a great tool for us to have. Um, and, and another, you know, the cameras in general, one of the biggest things I think the cameras do is for anybody can look at those cameras and um, see where the smoke is drifting, see where the fire is going. Um, so that that's, that's good too. So you can almost, you can make educated decisions without government telling you what to do that you can say, Oh, looks like this fire is, is getting out of control. I'm going to get my, my stuff ready. I'm going to start preparing um, versus waiting for government to tell you what to do, which, I mean, that that's my personal bias point of view. So um, mm -hmm. the bad thing about these cameras being aimed at the fires is uh, then you don't, you know, then the cameras aren't detecting fires in the other field of vision. So we ultimately got to go to a more um, robust system that's always detecting every part of this county. Um, and so we're, we're not there yet, but I see there's a lot of stuff, artificial intelligence, remote sensing, I see there's great potential um, in the cameras. So without giving you a yes or no answer, that's just some of my thoughts about these cameras and okay. detection. Yeah. And lastly, I would like to ask you offline about the ballot measure and the consolidation of fire departments. Can I talk, call you and make a time for that? Sure. That's the agenda item that's on next, Tuesday, next Tuesday, July yeah. 20. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can call you. Thank you. Hey, Marshall, this is uh, Brooke. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Great information. I'll definitely get, go back to the recording of this, this meeting to, uh, to learn more. Uh, tremendous amount of information. We really appreciate it. Um, and thanks for including uh, the links to these indices. Uh, those are really interesting to me, especially managing land with public access. We like to kind of be able to prepare uh, before we get into a red flag warning 
uh, so that when we do, you know, we, we're prepared to prepare to uh, evacuate the preserve if needed. Uh, one question I have to you is, um, have you seen any computer modeling that shows that we are going to see more frequent lightning storms uh, moving through our area? So I, I have not seen the exact computer modeling. I just know talking with some of my weather friends that, you know, the combination is, is the way I understand it. Ocean temperature, just the, the more general weather patterns are going to put put more lightning in our future. Um, I don't have the models to, to support that, and I probably couldn't understand it anyway. Um, I can see if someone like Brian Garcia or Ryan Walbrun, I mean, I, if you want to have him talk to this group, I can see if he'd be willing to do a talk with me um, and talk about that, if that is a potential. So, Great. Thank you. I got one question for you. Uh, considering a lot of the folks that are on the call right now are like agency type people, uh, but we also do a lot of communication with the public um, and other agency types. Just wondering in terms of outreach, if there's a message that you think that's not getting out and, and where, what, would, what could we be doing in terms of helping the most uh, with our communication to not only our partners, but to the public in general, that maybe it isn't getting out. Uh, so that's really open into Jason. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a lot, right? I mean, there's just, um, yeah. I mean, if we want to talk like forest management and veg management, I, I really don't think people know what a healthy forest looks like. And we talk about defensible space and everyone wants to focus on like the letter of the law um, versus like what, what is re, what is resilient what you know what's also now you know uh, drought resistant so um you know like good examples of what like a, i think i emailed you like what what is a shaded fuel break is, is that a clear cut or is that you know we want grass we want shade like good examples like bmps if you will i know you have some of these for other things um because everyone you know either wants to cut everything down or wants to save everything and we got to find some some median i think and and what is natural and um, mm -hmm. that, that's one message. The other message, I mean, I, I, I'll say it this way, um, before a fire, we got tons of options available during a fire. I have, my options are limited. I am bulldozing things and causing major destruction and making life or death decisions. And, and, and we mess up. Um, so let's, let's like, um, do we want to do, you know, I think the Forest Service is calling it pause now. Do we want to have strategic fire breaks and build like compartments where we can do prescribed burning in? Do we want to start creating like a, a mosaic pattern? I remember in college, they talked about strategically placed large area treatments, the splats in the Sierra Nevada, I think it was the 2000 report. So, you know, what, um, how do we manage more than just one person's parcel? And we know Sonoma County is very parcelized. And I saw your email, Brooke, the other day, I got to get back to you. You know, how do we, um, somewhat ignore ownership, ignore parcel lines, um, and, and whether we do strategic fire breaks or how we implement prescribed burning, how can we look at stuff more large scale? And then no firefighters are on the call, I don't think, but um, I think uh, our, our firefighters got to understand more about ecology, ecosystem, and just the, the why about forest management and and they don't see it that way. And I, you guys have heard me joke about this. It's either a black tree or a green tree. They don't really know the difference. You know, we got to get more like knowledge out there. And then I think, I don't know if anybody's on like Ensley or anybody's on the call, but then that kind of evolves a little bit into defensible space where they're telling people, Hey, go like cut everything down and, and moonscape stuff, Carly on, um, you know, they're not really getting like, what, what does the law mean? And that's, then I took member Jason, I mentioned about the BMP. So um, I, I think, there's so many different things I think we need to um, almost have like just like talking sessions or people coming together and, and just understanding, um, you know, what it what, what resilient is more than just a butter. What, is, what does that mean? And, you know, how do how do we become more resilient as a county, multiple counties? You guys were talking about vintners and stuff because I'm seeing vintners mobilize their own fire agents, you know, fire brigades. And now, you know, how do we um, how can we all work together, I guess, is a very simple answer. So. Well, and I can talk about a bunch of other topics if you'd like about this, but I think that's some of the stuff that, um, and I, well, I'm glad I kept this open-ended. Yeah. Some, some type of, uh, that I would have thought. 
yeah it's just a key, so I'm yeah and and right there. i mean just because i get exposure to all these different groups um and and i i just see there's like a lot of stuff where i'm like you guys really aren't seeing this other point of view you're really not seeing the big picture and i'm not saying I, i'm right because i'm probably not um and my experiences are different than other experiences but just to be able to present it out there and not make it like a firefighter thing a forest thing uh you know resilient thing like what is what it really what's the big big where where are we going what's what's going on big picture stuff so hey marshall i had another question for you um and you're a great proponent of uh prescribed fire uh you've done a lot of great work out here on the jenner headlands is there any movement towards having fire districts uh, actually plan and lead and carry out uh, prescribed fires uh, within their districts so that uh, you know, they would be the lead agency or their lead organization. They would provide some of that organization to these uh, different parcels of land. Uh, but, you know, during the off season when they're not fighting fires, perhaps they could be planning and carrying out these fires, uh, you know, along with the Good Fire Alliance providing uh, troops on the ground to, to help facilitate a good fire on the landscape. I think it's a definite possibility. Um, but I'm going to tell you the biggest issue with, with local government um, fire agencies, for the most part, is they don't understand environmental review or the process. And, you know, while you and I may throw around CEQA and NOES and stuff like it's everyday acronyms, and I'm not an expert in this stuff either. Most agencies don't know how to do that. And so they can get the funding. They have people. Some of those people need to gain experience in how to ignite. Uh, but the real issue is getting stuff through the environmental review process and planning it out and no firefighters on the call, but firefighters are some of the worst people in planning. You got to remember, a firefighter goes to work that morning with like no idea what they're going to do that, that that day other than watch TV and something, probably drink coffee. They are waiting for like an emergency, right? That is their mentality. So for them to say, in two weeks, we're going to go do this, it's just not kind of how the, 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 the shift firefighter thinks. And so, you know, I'm Cal Fire. I think that's some some of what Cal Fire's, some of our problem is we've gone more to being a fire, all risk fire department, like going to medical aid to vehicle accidents and lost the roots of being a land management agency. And so we need the RPFs, we need the planners, the people we want to talk to from, you know, just kind of stitch together projects. And that's what we're lacking. And so I honestly just don't see local fire districts having the ability to do that because they don't have any of that experience quite yet. Um, in, in lieu of that, you know, should an, could an RCD do that? Should another entity do that? I think that's possible. And then you basically pay the firefighters to be there if, if they're paid or you get volunteers to be there. Um, but as I kind of mentioned, not every firefighter is a good prescribed burner either. They don't always understand prescribed burning. They mainly go to fires in the summer and see always the worst case conditions. They don't know, you know, how you can, do, you know, a lot of stuff you do, you guys have, you know, you've been on these prescribed burns, you learn by doing it, just not get that exposure. So, I think there's a lot of things that got to happen um, in both, you know, the forestry departments, the fire district departments, um, because, you know, we can say, and you guys know about some of these laws coming about, right? We can take care of liability, we can take care of everything the environment review, but then who's going to staff these fires? So the 88 acres I burned last night, there's a fire truck out there, the landowners out there, uh, but that's a commitment. And most agencies are not willing to make that commitment. I, you know, I've gone kind of off on a soapbox there a little bit. Um, but I don't know in the short term, um, local government agencies necessarily taking on this driveway. Thank you. If you guys had a BTP or we got a BTP set up for large areas and then we plan it out, I think that's a good Great. Um, Okay. Oh my gosh. This is just amazing. And I really hate to cut us off. Um, maybe we can just have you come back again, Marshall, if your world isn't totally on fire <laughs> in the next couple of months. So it'd be great to keep this conversation going, but um, I do want to respect everyone's time and, um, and yeah, just thank you for presenting and everyone for these good questions. So thank we'll wrap guys. up. It's good to see a lot of similar names and faces. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Sorry, I'm a black box the nail. I can't That's okay. You're on the road. You're doing things. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, everyone. I'll uh, make this all available to you all. And um, I think last time we also posted Marshall's um, PowerPoint 
file on the website too. That might be nice for sharing along with this recorded presentation. So um, Marshall, if you could send me your, your file too, that'd be great. Definitely. Awesome. All right, thanks everyone. Have a good week and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye everyone.